people should get special thanks for developing the content of this briefing or workshop. Um, Shannon Hearn, Chris Kern, Tucker Jones, John North, and it sounds like maybe Jeffrey Whistler is also part of the presentation. So thank you to all of you. And also to Commissioner Woolley for recognizing several months ago that this would be a valuable thing to have for the commissioner so that we're up to speed on Columbia River issues. Um, the idea for today is to make the Fish and Wildlife Commissioners as informed as we can be about the layers and layers of Columbia River issues and conditions. And so ideally at the end of the day, um, we would be informed on policies, laws, issues, a little bit of the history and the status of the public resource, of course, that we manage. Um, might also touch on how the future management would be altered a bit by climate change and ocean conditions and what some of the solutions adapting to those changes are. Um, for logistics, we have four hours set aside for the workshop. All of the commissioners, of course, have a packet of reference and background materials. There should be a lot of time for questions to staff or to each other if the commissioners would like to do that. We'll take a couple breaks just to avoid um, Skype or Zoom fatigue, if you will. Um, why don't we start with introductions and um, maybe um, Commissioner Willie, you could start. Okay, um, thank you, Chair Wall. Um, I'm Greg Woley, a commissioner. I'm representing uh, commission, uh, Congressional District 3. It's the Portland metro area and some surrounding areas. And uh, this is my eighth year as a commissioner. Thank you. Which is on Yes, this yes, is, this is uh, uh, Commissioner Jill Zarnowitz, and I represent the first district of um, uh, Congressional District, and um, I reside in the area of Yamhill, Oregon. Thank you. Mr. Labhart. Ah, there we go. Um, good, morning, or good afternoon, everybody. Mark Labhart. I represent uh, Eastern Oregon at large, and I live in Sisters. Thank you. And Commissioner Spellbrink. Get going here. Uh, yeah, uh, Bob Spellbrink, uh, Congressional District 5, uh, home address in Siletz, Oregon. Thank you. And last, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Becky Hatfield Hyde, and I am in Paisley, Oregon. And I'm glad this is working. <laughs> Thank you all. And Director Melcher, I know you introduced yourself already, but would you like to mention the um, news article that came out today about the applications for COVID relief for the fishing industry? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, we did, uh, as you probably know, um, the department was the lead entity for the state of Oregon on the uh, the CARES Act relief for um, fishery participants. We worked very hard on that, and uh, just the application period uh, was just opened up beginning tomorrow, and uh, the press releases out, and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, we're the first. The first state, at least on the West Coast, to actually get the program in place and um, up and operating. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, so with that, let's go to Chris Kern to introduce himself and the presenters and start the briefing. Thank you. Um, coming through OK? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you uh, again. Um, appreciate the opportunity to talk through these issues with you, uh, with the commission today. Uh, for the record, Chris Kern, Deputy Fish Division Administrator for the Columbian Marine Programs, uh, and virtually online with me today are Tucker Jones, the Ocean Salmon Columbia River Program Manager, John North, the Columbia River Fisheries Manager, and Jeff Whistler, the Assistant Columbia River Fisheries Manager. Uh, just a bit of introductory material here. Um, as you know, the commission deals with lots of issues on the Columbia. Uh, you've no doubt recognized that a lot of those are pretty complex. 
And so this is a really valuable opportunity to dig a little deeper uh, on the overall issues, as opposed to um, often you'll you'll sort of be required to focus on singular issues as they arise. Um, the overall picture for the Columbia River and its fisheries are really more than just the sum of the parts. Um, and so this is a valuable opportunity, but even uh, despite the breadth we've got today and the amount of time we've got today, it, it has been tough to craft a presentation that uh, both has sufficient detail but doesn't go overboard and and become sort of undigestible as a result so um the compilation document that you received earlier this week i think helps with that so that was a really uh, good suggestion we got um and so there's a lot of supporting material in there some of it's um, directly relevant to this presentation some of it's more background material um, the intent was really to not just have it be useful today but something you can reference um, down the road as well so hopefully that will be useful uh, there's a glossary at the end of that that um, tries to define a number of the common acronyms you'll probably see relative to Columbia River over time. We usually make an, uh, well, we always make an effort to define those anytime we use them, but we do occasionally miss some. I don't think we've missed any in this presentation, but, but I can't guarantee it. Um, you shouldn't really have to refer back to that compilation today. We'll probably make references to some things that are relevant to things we're talking about that are in there, but there shouldn't be a need to directly cross-reference, uh, although obviously you're welcome to do so. Um, and that may be useful in a few scenarios I haven't quite envisioned. A um, little bit about how we have this organized. We've tried to split it up kind of topically um, in ways that were logical, although given the complexity, there's a lot of interrelations among the topics. and so. While it, uh, we tried to give a little logical flow, we may still bounce back and forth on some issues, and that that's fine. Um, we put in some breaks, um, basically a picture slide. This is a lot of text. Uh, and then at the end of each topic, we've inserted sort of a picture side, slide as a reminder, well, both to break up the, the text volume a little bit, but also because they seem to be uh, good potential places to stop and, and work on questions. Um, obviously, that's up to your discre discretion. Uh, this is your meeting, so however you want to handle that is totally fine. Um, just seem to be a, a potentially useful place to start. Uh, we've also tried to kind of set those up to give you at least some sense of where we are in the flow of the presentation in terms of how close to the end or beginning we might be. Uh, and then finally, we're going to rotate through here to just kind of break things up. We'll hand off between myself, Tucker, John, and Jeff throughout the presentation. Um, I'll be moving through the slides, uh, and I do know from some past experience there is a slight delay in moving from one slide to the next, uh, so don't be alarmed if we'll try to wait, uh, make sure we wait until the slide is actually fully visible before we start speaking to it, but if for some reason it looks like we may have missed that, um, that's probably the reason. Uh, so that's it, and I think um, if it's uh, fine with you, I'll go ahead and shift over to the slideshow itself. So that's it, and I think if it's fine with you, I'll go ahead and shift over to the slideshow itself. And this will take a moment. There you go. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yes. All right, and so I will need somebody to tell me if they can see the slide because while I'm in it, I can't see the Skype desktop. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, it should be an introductory, uh, just a, a header slide. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll just I'll just move along here then um, and get going. Um, I've already kind of given you the introductory material of sort of how we've organized this, so we'll just get going. I'll just move along here then um, and get going. And this should be the you should be able to see the introduction slide. Um, just as a background, um, you know, in our experience, salmon steelhead and sturgeon fisheries in the Columbia are, are really among some of the most intensively managed. Uh, certainly on the West Coast, if not probably the world, although I don't have a ton of experience across the world, but I do with the West Coast. And um, the way we manage the fisheries in particular is, is uh, for some folks who are from other venues, is, is shockingly intensive um, at, some, at some time. Um, we're managing these fisheries based on updated information on not only the run size, but also what the catch is, what the catch is made up of in terms of stock composition, which we'll talk about a little later. 
um, and as uh, how the fisheries are performing. All that is co basically continually updated during the fishing seasons. The other thing that's a little unique about uh, most of our fisheries uh, relative to some sort of worldwide fishery management approaches is we're not working in most in most cases under harvest uh, on, under catch uh, limits directly, but more uh, often on percentage limits for total fishery mortality. And, and we'll speak a little more about that. Um, in order to try and, um, you know, keep this presentation organized, we're, we're basically focusing on the Columbia River main stem uh, and in particular non-treaty fisheries in the Columbia main stem. And there is a map in your packet but when we say Columbia in the context today, we're largely talking about um, the, the Columbia from the mouth upstream to Lower Granite Dam on the Snake and Priest Rapids Dam on the Columbia. Um, not that there aren't fisheries upstream of those areas, but they're sort of managed under different frameworks than we're talking about today by and large. And, and so we're gonna, we're gonna focus in these other areas uh, that are mostly within that defined area. And I am moving to a slide that's titled conservation. Mostly within that defined area. Is that showing? Not yet. And I am Not yet. Okay. That gives me an idea of the delay. Is that showing? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. That gives me an idea of the delay. Sorry, how about now? Nope. nope. Oh my. <laughs> This could take some time then. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. There it is. Okay. It did pop up for a minute. Yeah, probably not. Okay. Probably wasn't in presentation mode. Is it? Is it? Did we have the conservation slide now, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, there's a delay there, so and and as I said, I can't. Uh, I can either see the presentation or I can back out and see the Skype window, but I can't see both. Okay. Um, there's a, a section of the packet that we mailed out that that has a lot of information and and lists out the the ESA listed Endangered Species Act listed stocks in the Columbia. Um, we'll reference a few of those, but we didn't intend to go through the list exhaustively. Um, those are a large component of our conservation concerns in the basin, but they're not the entirety of uh, the conservation concerns. And in other words, we, we are as concerned about conservation issues for uh, non-listed stocks as well as ESA listed stocks. Um, but a lot of our focus is the ESA listed components. And so we'll dig a little bit into those. Um, I thought it would be useful to put a little bit of background in here uh, to discuss um, sort of the conservation and recovery approaches for ESA listed fish in the Columbia in general, um, and then speak a little bit about how uh, harvest and other factors interact with that. Um, basic, basically, the foundational assessments for um, conservation of ES and recovery of ESA listed stocks are, are done in recovery planning efforts. And so all the ESA listed stocks have, have a recovery planning process associated with them. During the de development of those recovery plans, um, the scientists are assessing the viability of the population and also conducting some viability modeling, which are intended to estimate um, the effects of various factors on viability of population. And so um, you'll often hear us or others talk about what's called the all H approach. And, and this is sort of in recognition that there are multiple factors uh, affecting salmon populations in the basin. Uh, and this approach isn't unique to the Columbia specifically, but we have utilized it extensively here. And the four H's really are tr traditionally defined as hydro, habitat, harvest, and hatcheries. Um, we often will will talk about adding a P for predation. Uh, I do want to recognize that in a lot of cases, some of that predation is actually tied to hydro uh, development, such as um, um, sort of expansion of non-native predator fish, um, pinniped pinch points at Bonneville Dam, but there are other uh, predation uh, factors affecting the population such as um, uh, bird predation in the estuary area that are less directly linked. Um, we're not going to spend a bunch, uh, much time talking about predation today. We will talk about these other four uh, to at least some degree. Um, 
So in the recovery planning process, the scientists that are assessing the populations and working on the plan will, will have at least historically used a tool called the All-H Analyzer or uh, various um, versions of it. And essentially, that's just a model that is used uh, to help calculate um, the effects of all the H's together on the population. And this is in recognition that in order to meet recovery uh, in all the cases I'm familiar with and probably in all the cases, period, um, you really are looking at turning multiple dials in order to achieve that, that end goal of recovery. Um, and so they not only evaluate things like the quasi-extinction risk of an individual population, but they establish objectives uh, to help define when a population would reach a, a viability target that would be associated with recovery. And then upon that being done, they, those objectives essentially become uh, or are used to define the recovery goals. And as I said, uh, getting to that point requires working on all H's. For instance, if you were to eliminate harvest effects and do nothing else, you wouldn't get to recovery um, in these populations. So ODFW actively works on all these. Uh, all the H's. Um, Tucker will speak a little bit about the hydro side later. His, he and his staff are very involved in the activities and actions of the federal hydropower system in Columbia. Uh, of course, because we operate hatcheries as an agency, we're involved on that front and the hatchery actions in areas with ESA listed fish uh, operate under hatchery genetic management plans, which are really very much like a biological opinion, which we'll speak a little bit about later um, in other arenas. And while ODFW doesn't manage a lot of habitat or fish habitat directly, we do have uh, a number of habitat projects that are geared towards working on habitat to support recovery. And I will move to the next slide and see how long that takes. It's there. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the way the rest of the way out. <laughs> um, so from a conservation perspective, um, sort of from the ground up, uh, spoke a little bit about recovery plans. Um, in the case of the co-managed agreement with the USV Oregon um, process, which uh, again, that's another topic in a bit, we'll get into a little more. Um, the states and the tribes work with NOAA Fisheries and uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service to describe how fisheries will be managed in the river, what their impacts on ESA listed and other species are expected to be. Those, um, those proposed actions become the basis on which the federal agencies, uh, NIMS has responsibility for anadromous species in the basin, Fish and Wildlife Service for, for freshwater species. And in the cases we're talking about, that's largely about uh, bull trout in certain areas. Um, so this is mostly a NOAA fisheries discussion, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife is involved as well. Um, they will look at uh, the proposed actions, consult the recovery plans, and then and then cross-reference those to, to see if the proposed actions, in this case a fishery approach, um, provide the necessary conservation for the listed species um, per the recovery plans. Um, and so in the case of USV Oregon, the proposed fishery actions in that agreement um, basically uh, constitute the proposed fishery actions that NOAA and others would consult on. They will issue what's called a biological opinion, which is their review of those actions and the, their assessment of the outcome and determine if those are likely to jeopardize the populations as well as how well they, uh, how consistent they are with recovery plans. Um, if necessary, um, they can identify terms and conditions that would be added to uh, what we call the incidental take statement to ensure that we are meeting those intent, uh, the, the needs of the ESA and other conservation things, uh, conservation needs. And then um, another key of our uh, fisheries approach is also making sure we're consistent with uh, the USV Oregon management agreement, which is in part um, protecting reserve rights for the Columbia River Treaty tribes. Okay, one more. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, within the the biological opinion issued by NOAA Fisheries, and, and we had talked a little bit about climate change uh, in the recent past, there is actually a specific recognition in the recent the, the biological opinion on the current fishery agreement um, that speaks to uh, the applicability of abundance-based frameworks as being precautionary 
in response to climate change. And that is, as we've kind of described before, because they scale harvest opportunities in response to the abundance of the fish stocks. And those abundances are and will be affected by climate change. Um, and so there's a direct response there. Uh, it also is the case that there isn't anything in these agreements that says those um, impact limits and fishing rates have to stay static over time. So um, th they are intended to be adaptive if conditions worsen. Uh, and there is a time when uh, the current abundance-based framework isn't is no longer precautionary enough. They can and will be and will be modified. Um, another important point that I, I wanted to point out for folks is all the fisheries we're talking about here um, begin with some explicitly defined management limit or set of limits. Um, there isn't a um, everything is known going in what what the limits are going to be. Uh, generally speaking, other than in-season updates, um, there isn't a figuring out what the goal is during the season. We already know. Um, and those can be either uh, limits can be defined on ESA impacts. They can be defined by escapement. Um, those are the biggest two. Uh, and then we have, as I said, in-season management to adapt to changes. We have a, a section later on that that's a little more specific about what that means. Uh, so I do think it's important for transparency and um, and accountability to just ex uh, recognize that all these objectives, uh, conservation objectives in particular, are really very explicitly defined and understood before we even start fishing. And I'll go through just one sort of example of the effects of that. Uh, so you hopefully will see a slide that says example. Yes. Great. Um, I didn't didn't try to re replicate this process for all our stocks. That would take most of our time if we were going to do that. But this is just an example of one population, or one one ESA listed stock actually, uh, and this would be what we call the wild uh, the ESA listed Snake River Spring Summer stock. These are uh, spring and summer runtime stocks going back to the Snake River, uh, including some of the Northeast Oregon tributaries, but also a lot to Idaho. The blue line here is just a time series of the return size of that stock overall. And again, this is just the wild component. And then the red line is um, the total non-treaty mortality of that stock over that same time frame. The reason I thought it would be useful to show this is it really uh, kind of visually demonstrates what, what's often hard to describe. And it is really kind of the average allowable ESA impact on this stock is generally around 2% in the non-treaty fisheries. And so this is sort of a picture of what 2% means. Uh, and so you can see that their red line is is pretty hard to see um, because it's such a small percent. In fact, it's less than 2% of the blue line. Um, that 2% limit is uh, also about the rate that we uh, apply on steelhead as our top end uh, maximum for uh, upriver summer steelhead. And then on the next slide, I've blown that um, up by, by basically removing the axis, the, um, the total run size. And so you'll note the change in X in the Y axis on the left. The prior slide, it was um, ranged from zero to 70,000. On this slide, it's from zero to 2,000. And most of the values are actually at or less than 1,000. Um, this is the same red line from that other graph, and of note, from uh, the period 2010 through 2019, I just picked an approximate 10-year range of the most recent time. The sum of all those mortalities is 3,900 fish. Uh, the sum of the total run size over that same time frame was 244,000, and so that's, uh, if I did my math right, it's about one and a half, one point six percent of the of the um, run as non-treaty mortalities. So this is just, you know, one example of the sort of scale we're talking about what 2% might mean on a population basis or on an ESU basis. Um, that is the first break point and we have a long ways to go. Um, but this was one of the first places we thought it might take time to stop and take questions if that's what you'd like to do. Or uh, what's your What's your preference, Chair Wall and Commissioners? Oops, give me a um, Commissioners, are there questions? 
Actually, can I ask one, Chris, and then we'll give the other commissioners a minute to figure out their questions and get them written down. Um, could you talk about, you said that abundance-based precaution is built into the response um, for climate change. Could you talk a little bit about how that would play out? Oh, sure. Um, well, so so the way I envision this is is the abundance of the fish stock that we're talking about, and the abundance-based approach is applied in a number of places, um, is is fundamentally going to be one of the key responses we expect to see under climate change. As we see productivity or other factors, whether it be um, spawning survival or survival in the ocean, as those are affected by climate change, I think the the net um, one of, not the only, but one of the key things we would expect to see would be um, probably more frequent low-end abundances relative to maybe historic. And so if you have your harvest rate schedule set up such that you reduce your percent impact at lower run size. So for instance, um, and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm going to wing it, but in your package, um, there's a table, it's probably called table A1, and it's referring to this, the upper uh, upriver Spring Chinook run harvest rate schedule for the U.S. v. Oregon agreement. And if you look at the non-treaty section of that, at the very lowest abundance, that fishery uh, impact allowed for non-treaties is something like less than a half a percent. And the intent there is really that it should be as close to zero as possible. And then the highest end number is something like 2.2 or 3 percent. And they're spaced out relatively um well, and I won't say evenly, but they're spread out from from that low end to the high end. And so you uh, as abundances increase, you would go up on your allowable harvest rate. And conversely, and probably more importantly, in this case, when you go down in abundance, you 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 don't just take a constant fraction at low abundance. You actually take an even lower fraction at the low abundance. And so the response you would expect to see one of the responses you would expect to see under climate change is a more frequent present in the low end of that range and therefore at a low you would see a more frequent response of lower harvest rate um, i think it's also important to recognize that that's that's sort of how it's currently structured that table could be restructured with a whole new suite of harvest rates that were even lower if that was necessary um, as we observe the effects of climate change too so uh, there's sort of two sides uh, or two contributing factors, I would say. Um, that would require a specific action, but but it is completely within the range of what is considered. Does hey, that Chris. help? Chris, this is also, this is Tucker, uh, for the record, Tucker Jones, Ocean Salmon, Columbia River Program Manager. Uh, I'd also say that, you know, these rates are adaptive, right? They scale up and down based on the abundance, but, you know, some of the other work we're doing in, in the Columbia River is trying to raise that floor, right? Uh, salmon runs are cyclical. They always have been cyclical, uh, but we are trying to take these other actions uh, outside of the, the fisheries, the harvest age, uh, so that when we are in these low end ranges, the low end is, is not as low as it has been over the last you know, 20 to 50 years. Thank you. That's yeah. helpful. Um, one quick follow up and then um, other commissioners, you should jump in because um, unless Michelle can see it, I'm not able to see him, you know, when you have a chat number so, or a chat request to ask a question. Um, on item on slide five, you talked about management limits for all fisheries. Are those for both wild populations and hatchery? for each fishery or are they primarily for hatchery? Uh, I would actually say the most of our management limits we operate under are for ESA listed wild stocks. There are um, there are some hatchery based goals, one of which would be the Upper Columbia Summers, which is a non-listed stock. It's a escapement goal that is um, actually combined hatchery and wild escapement all in all sort of rolled together. Um, so it's much more common for us in terms of management metrics uh, directly as a sort of a spelled out limit in a written document somewhere. Uh, the large majority of those are wild fish based in the Columbia. Thank you. 
Other commissioners? The large majority of those are wild fish based in the Columbia. Then why don't you keep moving, Chris? Great. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to Tucker now. And you should see something called concurrency and co-management. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I'm going to switch over to Tucker now. Uh, we do. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chair Wall, members of the commission, I guess one more time. Uh, Tucker Jones, Ocean Salmon, Columbia River Program Manager. Switching gears a little bit, uh, talking about concurrency and co-management. Uh, where Washington and Oregon state waters uh, meet and I guess co-mingle, uh, the two states try to maintain concurrent regulations, uh, and and this is when I say concurrent regulations, we're not trying to divide the river down the state line. I mean, you know, basically bank to bank, uh, the regulations are going to be the same for anglers in both states, uh, as long as we have this concurrency. Uh, there are several reasons uh, for this. You know, first, I think, and foremost, is uh, is for enforcement. Um, neither states' uh, enforcement divisions have jurisdiction to enforce the other states' rules uh, if we are in a situation with non-concurrent regulations. Uh, but when we are, uh, you know, a, a Washington uh, state fish and wildlife uh, officer uh, can make a contact with an Oregon uh, angler and vice versa, an Oregon state uh, trooper can make contact with a Washington angler. Uh, and if they are in violation of the joint rules, either state can uh, make an enforcement action. Uh, you know, also, non-concurrence on policy issues can be difficult. If the two states are, are have different policies on locations, for instance, uh, then you know our management staff are going to have difficulty structuring fisheries that uh, that meet objectives for uh, either of the commissions or you know really are satisfying for anglers. And then I guess finally participation, you know. For those anglers is complicated um, if those regulations are different. Anglers need to know uh, exactly what they can do and where they can do it uh, with respect to the regulations in those joint waters. Next. It's up. All right. Uh, as you know, a response to some pretty significant problems. Uh, with right. non-concurrency, um, particularly on the enforcement side, the two states agreed that a, a process was needed uh, to improve coordination uh, and communication. Uh, this was done in, in 1915, so it's quite a different world uh, from now, uh, and not just because they it didn't have to stay at uh, home. and. <laughs> uh, I could get away with wearing a uh, tie and short pants. Um, but uh, the compact was formed, uh, ratified by Congress, uh, and it's the primary and, and a very public venue to coordinate these management uh, purposes. And we still use this basic form today. Uh, there are some interesting rules related to that. Uh, by statute, uh, Oregon statute, the compacts need to be held uh, in Oregon or Washington within 25 miles of the Columbia River where commercial fishing is permitted. Uh, and so you kind of have sometimes a difference between the Columbia River Compact or Joint State Hearing. Compacts uh, are generally, um, you know, pertaining to those commercial fisheries. Uh, joint state hearings uh, deal with the uh, recreational fisheries, but functionally the process works the same. Uh, and you know the compact is not a rulemaking entity. Each state must then enact uh, their rules via the state process. It's really that coordination. The compact is not a rulemaking entity. Each state must then enact their rules via the state process. As Chris said, uh, you know management on the Columbia River is a, a joint process. It's actively managed throughout the course of the year. Uh, we have, on average, about 50 or so hearings in, a, in an average year, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, but basically, that's almost uh, one a week. Uh, and so 
when you consider that actually very few occur um, during those winter months, uh, that, that can be quite regular during the course of the spring, summer, and fall, uh, frequently more than two times a week. Uh, we're taking in information, uh, analyzing that, assessing it, and then uh, making management recommendations. Uh, so really that the particularly our busiest times uh, are in the spring and in the fall. So as a commission, uh, you guys can expect to see a lot of you know, temporary rules uh, associated with those seasons during those time periods. Uh, I should probably mention that it, it's completely normal right, for this actively managed fishery and a large volume of rule changes isn't something that indicates a need for alarm or anything. It, it's just us reacting to information that that it comes in in real time. Uh, we can and do make rule changes for positive things, uh, probably as much or more for, for negative things. Uh, so, you know, really, I guess try not to be alarmed if you see, you know, several of these in your in your packets under temp rules during each meeting. And next, and that would take us to our uh, our next uh, landing uh, pad. You can see we're, we're making progress. We've, uh, if you're following the pictures, we've moved from uh, eyed eggs to uh, yolk sac larvae. So we're we're making progress, but still a ways to go in the presentation. <laughs> Commissioners, any questions? I have a question. Can, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, um, Tucker, one. Uh, this isn't a very well thought out question, but it just, um, you know, there's it, when I when you're talking about the Columbia River Compact in Klamath, we have a Klamath Compact, which is basically, in my opinion, it's been really toothless on on all fronts for at least the last 20 years that I've been involved. And that has is, I think, primarily because of the federal relationship, um, trust relationship with our tribes in the basin. I guess, can you kind of help shape my mind? Are you feeling like all of that um, trust relationship stuff is happening in the development of the biological opinions and the tribes are content with that or do the tribes actively engage with the Columbia River Compact in a different way on the Columbia or can you help me out there? Uh, sure. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. So we will have a section on the U.S. v. Oregon uh, management agreement uh, coming up here pretty quick but the tribes are active co-managers uh, in the region, they're sovereigns. They have uh, their impacts, and, and we have ours. We sort of hash those out in that uh, U.S. Fuel Oregon uh, arena. Um, and then within the compact, uh, I think there's a lot of coordination and work together on uh, managing those fisheries. So um, the tribes do come to the compact with proposals. Uh, they generally, as I said, they're co-managers and they're sovereigns. So, uh, you know, they're setting their own rules about those fisheries, um, those treaty commercial fisheries. When we're talking with the compact, we are frequently, you know, looking to make concurrent rules uh, with them. And so that would allow non-treaty buyers then to purchase some of those fish. Uh, but we're, we have, a, I think, a quite strong uh, collaborative uh, relationship with the tribes uh, and Oregon and Washington uh, and, you know, the federal government as well. So, yeah, I, I think um, I'm not that familiar. You have to forgive me with the Klamath Compact, but, but the Columbia Compact, I think, functions pretty well. Uh, and I, I wouldn't call it toothless. I, I would say it's uh, well, I don't know what analogy I can make that's uh, I call it, it's, function sound, it's functional. Uh, it's definitely yeah. very functional. Yeah, and functional. I, I and that's interesting. It's just you know, it's unique to me that 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 vehicle is actually so functional and working. 
I, I mean, I think in Klamath Basin, the, the feeling is these these issues are really uh, actually, I think the tribes are pretty offended by the compact because it doesn't even, you know, all the laws and things that came in play came in play after the compact was signed. And so I guess it's just going to take me a while to get my head around how, and that's great if it's, if the compact is really functional and those relationships are working, but I think it'll be helpful once you go over the USB Oregon stuff. So I'll just stay dark until then. All right, Chair, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, if I may, the compact is actually uh, directly between Oregon and Washington uh, and is for managing those commercial fisheries on the river. But we do work regularly with the tribes on uh, managing, regulating, and accounting for those uh, harvests and impacts. Uh, but the tribes are definitely their own sovereigns. Yes. Yes. Other you. commissioner? Thank you. Other commissioners? Yes. Tucker, I do have one question about this. When you read all the summaries and look at all the documents and that sort of thing, the the um, Tucker, I do have one categories one kind of usually come down to sort of an order an orderly fishery as one of the huge goals or work areas, economic viability of the fishing industry. And conservation of the of the wild fish resource. Um, mo it seems like a lot of the work and effort and focus ends up in those three general areas. And the compact, if you were doing work on, say, other than orderly fishery, if you were doing work on a conservation piece or habitat, um, Chris mentioned habitat as you know one of the H's that we're trying to work on as well. Does the compact, um, does the way it's organized suit itself to the two states working on those kind of issues, or is it almost exclusively the allocation issues or the orderly fishery issues? Uh, Chair Wall, uh, good question. Compact is really focused on the, the harvest piece of those four H's. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, you know, really authority to uh, work on habitat issues or, or the hydro issues. Um, it is focused on those uh, harvest issues, but you know, the conservation piece of that is in there, right? Our, our harvest uh, impact rates are not um, are set so that they're not going to impede recovery. Uh, but as far as those other relationships, uh, you know, I guess an interesting piece of history. Uh, my program used to be referred to as the interjurisdictional program, which is uh, in some ways oddly descriptive and uh, and then also quite uh, vague. But basically, you know, we are working through the compact on managing fisheries and staying within those harvest constraints. Uh, but at the same time, the program is engaged regularly and actively uh, in working with our co-managers and colleagues throughout the basin. Uh, working on some of those other issues, uh, you know, the hydro issues, uh, the habitat uh, stuff that's going on up higher in the basin, the main stem habitat issues. Yes, definitely engage in those, but not through the compact. Thank you. Chair Wall, this is, this is Chris. Could I add a little bit to that? Because I think it was a, a good question. Sure. Um, and Tucker handled it. Tucker's response is, you know, uh, no, this isn't a different response, but just add a little to it. Um, the compact is really our communication venue um, relative to setting fisheries. And so um, it provides the place for Oregon and Washington in particular, but also the tribes and also the state of Idaho, National Marine Fisheries Service and the public uh, to interact and comment and discuss with us what the fisheries are doing, including the effect of those fisheries on conservation. And so the conservation is built in there, um, but it is during the compact process itself, it is pretty specifically to fisheries. Um, so I will, <clears throat> excuse me, I will say though that the compact plays a pretty significant role as does USV Oregon and other, and other venues that we use to interact with our co-managing partners um, to actually build the relationships that help us get to some of the other things. 
So, um, you know, Tucker works directly with uh, the, the representative from Washington um, who usually does compacts really regularly on hydro system issues. Uh, and so there's, there's, you know, sort of, I don't know if cross pollination is probably not the right word, but there's a lot of um, interaction and relationship building that the compact plays a role in. And while the compact is is also uh, set up to basically follow the conservation rules as they are outlined in our various management agreements or other uh, other plans, there are cases, and this year was one, in which the compact representatives will meet and say, "All right, we're going to do more than that. We're going to we're going to be more conservative than what that um, harvest schedule might say." And we we actually did that this spring, where things were looking pretty poor on the Columbia. Um, from a uh, technical standpoint and looking at our management agreement, we had uh, room on the non-treaty side of fisheries for additional fishing on the spring stock that, that uh, the two states collectively chose not to use um, because of the situation we were seeing in there. So um, there is conservation discussion in there, um, but it is generally focused on the fishery side. Thank you. Other commissioners? Then let's go ahead. Uh, Chair Wall, I, I see on the chat pane that it looked like there was a uh, question from Commissioner Lavart. Then let's go oh, okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Lavart. You're, you need to get closer to the microphone if you could. Go ahead, Commissioner Lavart. Okay. I'll try. Is any better? A little bit better. You need to get Tucker, can you hear him? If you could. I can, uh, Chair Wall. Maybe you could turn his volume up on his computer. Might help. Can you hear me better now? Uh, sure, well, yep, that's better. Okay. So, Tucker, I have a, a concurrency question. Um, as I'm sure both commissions are in total agreement that we want to be concurrent as much as possible. And it's mostly unimaginable the complexity that you and the rest of the staff have to deal with in terms of the regulations uh, throughout the Columbia um, that you have to look for concurrency on. Can you tell me and the public's that's listening what percent of the time, I have two questions, what percent of the time, first question, are is the two states concurrent on rules and regulations? It's pretty high, isn't it? Uh, for joint waters, we strive for pretty much... Uh, 100% concurrency, and then if we, you know, and that hasn't always been the case through history, but uh, of late we've largely been there. And if we're not going to be, uh, that requires really, you know, some, uh, you know, extensive conversations and negotiations between the states to try to to reach there because. You know, largely we've reached a spot where one state is, is really trying not to take uh, an action um, if we're not in agreement. Uh, you know, an example of that would have been this, uh, maybe this past uh, June. Um, it, it seemed to, uh, you know, Oregon that maybe we should be setting a, an estuary sturgeon fishery. Um, our co-managers in uh, in Washington disagreed, and ultimately we couldn't come to uh, uh, you know uh, an agreement that uh, involved concurrent regulations, and so we just uh, left those fisheries closed. Okay, you answered my second question, which which was, if you're not concurrent, what process do you use to try to get concurrency? Thanks. So I had already advanced the slide. Are we ready to move? Yes. And Great. So and I'll, I'll spend a little more time on this, um, given some of the questions we just had, because I think this, this section has the potential to address some of those. Um, in particular, I think the, the questions that Commissioner Hatfield Hyde was asking, I'm going to speculate not knowing too much about the Klamath Compact, but I'm going to speculate that most of the things that you're speaking to in terms of trying to reach agreements between the tribes and the state managers or whoever else might be involved, we've actually conducted through the U.S. v. Oregon agreement as opposed to the compact. And and that is um, uh, a good thing, but it is also a long and, and sometimes hard-fought thing 
Um, you'll see in your packet a little bit of background on the history of U.S. v. Oregon. That case was brought in 1968 and is, is technically in some ways still active today. Um, we just completed a new management agreement a couple years ago in the year that made the 50th anniversary of the initial case um, being brought against the state. Um, and uh, Director Melcher spent uh, quite a bit of time in the forum. I have now started to spend more time uh, in it and, um, you know, in talking to some of my predecessors who were there much earlier, as well as some of the tribal representatives who were there much earlier. There has been a, a gradual and significant um, improvement in relationships and in our ability to collectively work together to try and solve as many of the potential disagreement points that, that might come up in the agreement itself and in our relationships between um, the parties so that they never come to the compact or other arenas. It doesn't mean they don't. Occasionally something will happen. but. Um, our overarching goal is to basically resolve those at the ground floor at the U.S. v. Oregon table. And I would say in my time and looking back and comparing to some of the things I've heard, it has been very successful, particularly recently. Um, as with any agreement there, you know, I'd seriously doubt anybody in the parties would say it's all perfect. But the relationships we have is uh, actually something I'm quite proud to be part of. So um, that's a little bit of a soapbox that I, I hadn't planned to get into, but I think it's important. Um, so the case itself was brought against Oregon. Um, and again, there's a history link, I think, in your packet, so I won't go too deep. Um, basically to, um, uh, on behalf of the tribes, to ensure their reserve treaty rights for fishing were being honored, um, because at the time they really weren't. And so over time, we've engaged through this process, which is now just kind of colloquially referred to as U.S. v. Oregon, which is just the case name, um, to discuss as a group how we will jointly manage fisheries uh, to protect the treaty reserve rights. Uh, also, is, since listings have occurred uh, in the early 90s to current, um, to protect and recover ESA listed stocks. And the long-term goal, which it was there before even ESA listings became a, a an issue we're you know just generally managing for sustainable fisheries and i mentioned before this this agreement um for the places where the agreement covers uh, which we'll talk a little bit about is basically the the foundational component the the federal agencies use in their review um so the federal agencies have the responsibility for reviewing the proposed actions for esa compliance although they don't have a regulatory role on the fisheries themselves in the columbia they simultaneously have the um, responsibility of acting as trustees for the treaty tribes uh, to ensure protection of their reserve rights. So they're in a in a unique position, uh, the federal agencies, in terms of um, being responsible for a couple of significant elements of the agreement themselves. The U.S. v. Oregon parties now operate, um, and there's a list in the packet of who those parties are, um, with basically three bodies uh, that function to uh, help us do this coordination, discussion, negotiation when necessary, uh, occasionally dispute resolution. Uh, the primary body is the policy committee. That's uh, made up of representatives from all the parties. Uh, we have about five or six meetings a year. I've got one coming up next week. And that's where we have our um, discussions of any upcoming issues, problems we may be experiencing, um, coordination, just keeping each other apprised of things that are going on. It's also where we did most of the negotiations for the agreement. Um, I serve on that policy committee uh, as a designee for Director Melcher. Uh, we also have the technical advisory committee, which you'll often hear us talk about, um, usually just um, abbreviated as TAC, T-A-C. Um, Jeff and John are both on that body, and those are the fishery experts and science experts that um, essentially primarily focus on um, providing technical input and advice to the policy committee uh, relative to the fisheries themselves. The other significant aspect of the agreement um, does deal with production of hatchery fish in certain areas that are uh, of a joint importance to the tribes and the states. So not every production program is in there, but a significant number of them are. Um, and there's a production advisory committee, which is very similar to TAC. Um, we have uh, Andrew Gibbs is our representative for ODFW on that. 
and similar to the TAC, they advised the policy committee on production issues. So, um, do you, you know, updating us on the status of HGMPs or changes to HGMPs in production, how things are looking for various programs throughout the year, and things like that. Um, and I'll move to the next slide. You'll hear us talk about treaty and non-treaty um, various times. The treaty fisheries are those conducted under the agreement um, by the Columbia Treaty Tribes, and, and those are listed in your package, the Umatilla, Nez Perce, Warm Springs, and Yakima Tribes. Um, those are the, the four treaty tribes that are members of the U.S. v. Oregon um, parties. Um, there are non-treaty fisheries is basically anything else. So that primarily means those managed by the states, but it also includes some fisheries conducted by tribes that are not um, within the four treaty tribes. And so these, the couple of the key ones are not exclusively, but a couple of them would be uh, Colville and Wanapum, uh, as well as I think Spokane and some other tribes. Um, so, so those fisheries where they are in the U.S. v. Oregon management area would actually be characterized under the non-treaty side because they are not um, one of the four Columbia Treaty Tribes. We often also call the Columbia Treaty Tribes, you may hear them referred to as CRITFIC Tribes, which is the CRITFIC is Columbia River and Tribal Fisheries Commission. And that's a body that the four tribes formed in the 70s uh, to aid with uh, coordination and implementation of the management agreements. Um, what U.S. v. Oregon doesn't tackle, it doesn't generally address effects of fisheries on stocks that are destined to remain downstream of Bonneville Dam, and that is um, specifically because, <clears throat> generally speaking, um, the agreement is focused on fish stocks that are headed towards uh, traditional tribal fishing areas. And so, uh, for instance, the Willamette River um, uh, fisheries are not part of the U.S. v. Oregon management agreement. Um, I will point out that, you know, I mentioned the U.S. v. Oregon provides the venue for us to seek ESA compliance for a number of these fisheries. For a fishery that's not a component of that agreement, like the Willamette, we then have to, the states have to then go seek um, uh, ESA compliance um, under other venues, and, and but using very similar approaches to what I described earlier. So I think that takes us to a break um, where we may have some more questions that have come up on that. Commissioners, I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, there was a incident, I think, uh, a few years ago of uh, some of the tree tribes um, fishing at uh, Willamette Falls. And um, I, I don't, uh, I'm just kind of curious about how that started and how it played out. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Zarnowitz, I, I think you're you're talk, talking about salmon fishing at Willamette Falls? Yes. Um, I might have to punt that one to Director Melcher because I think that occurred when, when he's more familiar. My understanding would be that that um, we reached an agreement or, or formulated an agreement to allow them to do that in years where um, the upriver run was highly depressed. We do have some provisions in the agreement about trying to help them get um, ceremonial fish uh, under really dramatically poor conditions. We do have some provisions, and that may be related. Trying to help them get ceremonial. Uh, yeah, Chair Wall and Commissioner Sarnowitz, this is Kurt. The um, uh, Chris is correct. The Columbia River Treaty Tribes did fish at Willamette Falls. I want to say we had an agreement with them for three years. It could have only been two years in ninety. 94, 5, or 1995, 6, and um, so we basically adopted state rules that allowed them to, to fish for salmon at Willamette Falls, and that was because of the extremely depressed nature of the uh, Columbia River run. If you'll recall, the Columbia River Spring Chinook run in 95 was, I think, like 15 or 20,000 fish total, um, and so we... We had them, we allowed them to fish at Willamette Falls to meet their basic um, ceremonial and subsistence needs, or at least attempt to. Uh, they haven't fished for salmon since those years at Willamette Falls. The, they do fish every year at Willamette Falls for lamprey, and that's under a state-adopted, commission-adopted season. 
And uh, then, of course, the Grand Ronde tribe has fished, um, has a limited fishery at Willamette Falls, again, under commission-adopted rules. Um, and that's the extent of it. Okay, thank you. Chris, I have one follow-up question as well. You said when you were talking about USV Oregon and how it operates, the, how the table operates, that there are things that go to that table and then don't need to go on to the compact. Can you give an example so we know what kind of issues those are? Um, sure, Chair. Well, I can. Well, I can. I can give you a sort of a contextual example. I can't think of a specific one, but. Um, okay. Our goal through the management agreement is to define to the party's satisfaction how the resource and the conservation of the resource uh, responsibility for conservation of the resource are going to be shared. And so amongst the tribe, the treaty and non-treaty side. And so um, among those is sort of like the, the harvest rate table I mentioned before, which is, um, you know, you've got a, a, a agreed upon structure that says under these conditions, here's what the fishing should look like. And generally speaking, um, that means the compact doesn't have to decide what should that fishing look like. And the tribes in the states don't have to try and resolve a discrepancy between what that table says in the compact venue. We will have already done so at the US v. Oregon table. Now, if for some reason, um, this is all hypothetical. One of the parties set, decided um, in between policy committee meetings or something else that, that, you know, they didn't like that harvest table anymore. They might bring it up in the compact, but that would not meet the dispute resolution requirements in the agreement. Um, the compact really, in my view, wouldn't have a role in trying to resolve it, but it could get it could get sort of tabled in that scenario. Um, I don't know if that helps, but that, that's sort of what I was trying to get at. Thank you. That helps. Okay. Thank you. I guess, uh, and uh, Chris, if I could just um, add to that, this is Kurt. Um, the uh, if you maybe the simplest way to think about it is the the compact is really just the implementation arm, and I think Chris kind of mentioned that earlier. But if you looked at it historically, before there was a U.S. v. Oregon management agreement, the compact set the seasons. They looked. They also uh, worked collaboratively on escapement levels, but post US v. Oregon, where we have all of these fisheries um, essentially described, you know, in agreement with the tribes, in a court-ordered agreement with the tribes. And then later, post ESA listings, not only do we have those agreements with the tribes under US v. Oregon, but we also have uh, biological opinions and um, the, you know, kind of the federal approval of, of those plans. The compact is really just the implementation arm and so where there's issues of, you know, of, you know, for instance, allocation between various non-Indian sectors, yeah, that might well come under the purview of the compact. But um, the really foundational, um, the really foundational pieces are in the other agreements and the compact is merely implementing. And some of those foundational pieces are not in any uh, federal or U.S. Oregon agreement. I would um, submit the uh, the escapement and um, the, the scaled escapement goals and the sport and commercial allocation of Willamette Spring Chinook is in commission adopted rule. And so the compact is is making decisions that, again, are just implementing the, the direction that, that um, exists in other forums. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those help a lot. Thanks. Shall we keep going then, Chris? Sure, sure. And and I, uh, we're we're here at your discretion. So if you reach a point where you'd like us to break, um, you know, or anything else, just holler and we'll we'll do so. We'll shoot um, for a break. yeah. We'll shoot for a break at two thirty, just so people know. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn this over to. I think John was going to take this next section. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is John North, Columbia River Fisheries Manager. Um, as Chris mentioned, not all of the Columbia River management objectives are defined in the U.S. v. Oregon management agreement, but it, it does guide a majority of our management approaches, and we do work hard to comply with that agreement. Our primary goal 
uh, for the fisheries is to make sure they meet the conservation needs for all the stocks that we manage. And specifically for ESA listed stocks, those fisheries should not impair recovery, but contribute to uh, long-term uh, growth and recovery as much as possible. And an example of that is by, say, using mark selected fisheries whenever they're practical to help improve wild to hatchery fish ratios on the spawning ground. And for non-ESA listed, Stocks, we manage fisheries to ensure the populations are sustainable over the long term. Uh, next. On, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so the allowed rates in the management agreement are not only met, uh, meant to meet our conservation goals, but they also address sharing uh, of conservation needs and harvest between the treaty and non-treaty fisheries. And this is necessary to recognize the treaty tribes reserve rights and ensure that they are met. Um, so rather than total allowed harvest or escapement based management, most of our fisheries in the Columbia are managed and measured in terms of rates, either a harvest or an exploitation rate. And both of those are basically just measures of the allowed percent of the population that can be harvested. Uh, harvest rates are specific to an area and exploitation rates of total abundance. Um, uh, next slide, sir. So this, uh, much of what we do is represented by this figure, which essentially portrays a simple fraction with the numerator being the fishery mortalities and that includes kept fish and release mortality uh, and the denominator in the fraction being the abundance of a given stock. So whether it's pre-season planning or in-season monitoring or post-season accounting, we're, we are constantly tracking the numerator and the denominator to ensure we stay within our allowed impact rate. The trick to this is that both sides of the fraction are constantly changing and we only control the top half uh, with harvest and changes to the denominator of the abundance can also alter the allowed rate. So we need to constantly monitor and adjust those fisheries as, as, uh, as we need it and as we go through the season. So next slide. So for this process to work, most of our Columbia River fisheries require continuous in-season monitoring, uh, which is critical to our management of growth. There really is no set it and forget it uh, type of management for the Columbia River. Uh, change is common, constant, and, and necessary in order to balance fishing opportunity and conservation needs. This, this uh, figure here, the management uh, harvest management cycle, it's just the typical process for a Columbia River fishery where we start the season, depending on the forecast for the various stocks, and that allows us to determine the harvestable numbers and then develop our fishing seasons and regulations around those expectations. So once the fish begin to return and the fisheries are up and running, the increase in management goes into high gear to track the harvest and the runs. That often results in refinement of the pre-season plans and, and changes to the fisheries via the compact front state process. We'll, we'll often cycle through the lower half of this figure repeatedly in season sometimes progressively reducing fisheries and sometimes the action is to liberalize the fisheries to a better than expected return. But eventually the season will end and, and uh, that allows us to move on to our postseason run reconstruction and then that leads to forecasting the following year. And to make things even more complicated, uh, most of our seasons have multiple ESA listed stocks present and each of those has their own management constraints and the fisheries are managed to the weakest component so there are a lot of moving parts to keep track of. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
So that is our checkpoint and about a third of the way through the overall presentation. Uh, take any questions on those slides. Commissioners, questions? I'd like to, to go back one more time to, to this question. That it's kind of a basic one that I have. Um, a lot of the management plans talk about how critical habitat is and that that's often mostly somebody else's job, if you will. We clearly pay attention to it in the fisheries management, but our tool seems to be more harvest than, than other things. So because we, we are trying to have these stocks be sustainable, what are the connections and are they more connections than we were making in the past between harvest and habitat so that the, the people working on harvest are also working sort of next to neck and neck with the habitat efforts? Uh, Chair Wallace is Chris, I, I can take a shot at it and then other folks can, can jump in if they want. I, I think I'd, I'd go back to the all H sort of approach. Um, you know, John and, and Jeff in particular are um, <laughs> plenty busy uh, trying to figure out the fishery side of things here. Um, and, and so, you know, they're, they're full time on that as well as some, re, you know, directly related issues. As an agency, um, you know, we're uh, some of it's structural, so a lot of the habitat work, particularly in the Columbia Basin, uh, is focused uh, out of the out of the east, re, you know, eastern side of the state under under Bruce Eddy's um, programs. Not all. Uh, we've got the Willamette programs, some West Side programs, um, and a lot of that is being done uh, under the um, either BPA funding for um, primarily primarily that and some other things for. Um, the um, Fish and Wildlife Program under the Northwest Power and uh, Conservation Council, um, and so you know there's 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 some specialization going on. There are folks who who do primarily habitat work, and there are folks that do primarily fishery work. And then our goal is, as an agency at the policy level, to be coordinating those actions, um, not necessarily with the field staff that are doing the actual on the ground work, working together. But just to make sure we're looking at all those H's together, uh, the recovery planning process in particular is uh, very important for that. Um, I kind of touched on that earlier. Um, those are sort of the venues where we look at that the most. I don't know if that's helpful. It is helpful. Thank you. And, and Chair Wall, this is this is Tucker. If I could just chime in here a little bit again, uh, you know, the, the fisheries. Uh, and the habitat work and the hydro work, it's, these are all sort of large and, and to be completely frank, uh, at times daunting tasks. And, mm -hmm. and so I think trying to have like, you know, one set, uh, trying to do all of them concurrently can be difficult. But people are trying to stay abreast of things. We're generally a pretty well coordinated agency. But I think part of this also comes around, you know, I think in your question to the uh, to the dials in play, right? I mean, if we could think about, uh, I sometimes think uh, uh, if we're talking right now about like habitat and harvest dials, right? Uh, yes. Like harvest might be a small dial, but it's easy to turn, right? Like you can turn it and you can get a result very quickly, right? We can open a fishery or close a fishery in relatively short amount of times. And so you can easily adjust that. And for us as managers, that's something we in turn. Habitat yeah. right, is a is a potentially bigger dial and we're turning it, but it turns a lot slower, right? And so as you turn it, and so even it turns slow because it takes a while longer to do those actions, but the results of those actions also take longer uh, to come to fruition. Thank you. Good way to describe it. Thank you. Other questions, commissioners, or are you, are you ready to move on? I have uh, one question. Um, kind of uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure if this is in um, your program, Chris, or not, but um, I know a lot of negotiations go on with BPA on flows for fish. Is that going to be handled in this presentation, or is that going to be is that a completely different program? Uh, that would actually be Tucker um, and his uh, another portion of his program, and we do have about uh, ten or eleven slides on that on that topic okay. coming up. I'll wait for that then. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, it'll be good. Okay, shall we go on then? Yeah, we have we have one more slide here, and then another break, which is is uh, most mostly just due to me trying to be diligent about sticking to the topic, then break. Um, so I apologize. It's going to be one quick slide, and John is going to go over this one. Yeah, yeah. Continuing on, uh, we wanted to briefly touch on the North of Falcon and uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council process and the link to our Columbia River fisheries. Uh, North of Falcon refers to an annual series of public meetings involving uh, state federal and, and tribal representatives as well as the recreational and commercial fishery interests with the, the purpose of developing a pre-season uh, plans for ocean fisheries occurring from Cape Falcon which is near Manzanita, Oregon on the Oregon coast, North Oregon coast and uh, up to the Canadian border as well as the summer and fall fisheries in the Columbia. And this uh, North Falcon process coincides with the March and April meetings of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, and that's, that's the federal authority responsible for setting ocean salmon fisheries uh, three to two hundred miles off the Pacific coast. This, this uh, entire process allows for discussion and negotiation and coordination between the ocean and freshwater fisheries to um, ensure that our conservation objectives are met because the uh, harvest impacts for certain salmon stocks are shared between fisheries. Uh, and as a reminder, we've uh, included a web link about the North Falcon process in your workshop materials and there's additional detail about the process if you want to pursue that. So just one, just one slide here. Thank you. Questions, commissioners? Then, um, Chris, how are there? Is there another section we could go through and then stop for a few minutes at, say, in about 10 minutes? Yeah, I think we could get through. I think the next section would probably be the one to stop after. Uh, then okay. we're going to start getting into some longer sections. Okay. But yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead. And I think we're going to shift to Jeff on this one. Great. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Chair Wall and Commissioners and Director Melcher. Uh, Jeff Whistler here. The next two slides I'm going to cover uh, deal with the select area fisheries, which you've probably heard uh, about to, to some extent. Um, these are unique fisheries that are part of the larger umbrella of fisheries within the Columbia River that, that we manage and, and, and uh, deal with, and, and we're going to cover here today. But we wanted to highlight this uh, this particular um, program a little bit for you guys, um, given that the recent commission policies have increased the focus of uh, commercial fisheries uh, within these areas. Um, there's a lot of additional information in the packet you guys got, so we're just going to keep it fairly high level here, but wanted to make sure um, we did cover this this component of the overall fisheries. So the, the map up on the screen here for you uh, shows roughly the, the lower 30-ish miles of the Columbia River, uh, essentially from the mouth up, upstream to about Skamakaway, Washington. And the current uh, sites uh, affiliated with the Select Area Program are, are highlighted in the, in the boxes there shown. And essentially the basic concept of this program it, it's kind of a, it's a holistic hatchery harvest program and the basic concept here is to leverage the spatial separation of these sites uh, from they're, they're removed from the main stem migration corridor which contains mixed stocks the common theme in columbia river fisheries is mixed stock fisheries it's a huge basin as you all know many species many stocks and so the idea here is to um, concentrate hatchery harvest 
many or harvest of hatchery fish and hatchery production in off-channel and terminal areas to basically stay away from most of the issues we, we have when we're dealing with mixed stock fisheries. So th this concept was uh, has been going on for a, a long time. It was started in the 1960s in, in Young's Bay. There was a period of expansion with BPA funds in the early and mid 90s that uh, um, led to uh, additional research into additional sites outside of Young's Bay. Uh, there was a lot of research done at the time to evaluate uh, both rearing and harvest potential criteria. And the sites that, that we have in place today um, were the most successful um, um, most successful that were identified at, at that time. And the primary goal here is to maximize the return of program released fish to the fisheries while keeping encounter rates with non-local stocks, including ESA listed stocks, to a minimum. So there are basically two, two hatchery rearing um, approaches employed. Uh, there are local area hatcheries, which are uh, shown by the stars there on the map. And there are net pen acclimation sites, which are shown by the, uh, the red boxes there. So each of these sites has kind of a, a mix of net pen acclimation and, and local hatcheries that are contributing hatchery origin fish for harvest. And the idea there is, is to acclimate fish to these local areas, which will then maximize the homing of the returning adults and allowing relatively high harvest rates which in turn functions to minimize straying of these stocks into uh, natural production areas. And the, the harvest rates that, that we're able to achieve on these particular um, hatchery stocks are extremely high and far exceed uh, return to fishery rates that, that are seen in, in other hatchery programs. Uh, all of the stocks released here uh, have harvest rates of 90 plus percent on the returning adults. Not just in these areas, uh, there are other fisheries that, that to benefit from the, the hatchery programs here as well. The bulk of the harvest does occur uh, in the commercial fisheries within these sites specifically. And I would be remiss if I did not mention um, the long-standing partnership we, we've had with Clatsop County um, in this program. They have been involved um, alongside ODFW since uh, the 80s. And um, a lot the, the net pen rearing concept really started with, with local uh, local personnel uh, in Clatsop County um, working to enhance the fisheries in, in their areas. And uh, personally, I, I would say that the production aspect, the production side of this program probably would, wouldn't be possible without the, the dedication of, of Clatsop County staff and, and this longtime partnership that we've had. Uh, the, the last point I'll, I'll make on this slide here is that uh, the Hatchery Scientific Review Group, a uh, congressionally uh, mandated group that was uh, active about 10, 10 years ago or so, uh, they conducted a, a basin-wide review of, of hatchery programs um, within the Columbia Basin, and they specifically called out this concept uh, as, as a best use of hatchery production and, and uh, return to fisheries. And next slide, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, so th this program, um, well, I, I do need to mention there, there is one site there on the Washington side. We do Washington WDFW is, is one of the partners in this program as well. I can't forget them. Uh, the, the program itself rears a, a, a mix of stocks. There are Lower Columbia uh, Spring Chinook, primarily Willamette stock uh, Spring Chinook, Lower Columbia River Coho, and there's a Bright stock um, Fall Chinook. Uh, select area Brights, you've probably heard uh, mention of these. Uh, these originated from egg transfers back in the 1980s uh, from the Rogue River, uh, but has been maintained as a standalone uh, broodstock program, a production program um, in the local area here ever since. And additionally, there, there's another fall Chinook stock, uh, Thule type fall Chinook, 
not strictly identified as, as part of this program. Uh, it's part of the Mitchell Act production for other purposes, but um, some the production is released here to kind of leverage the the, the high harvest rates uh, that, that we exhibit on, on the returning fish just prior to return to, to hatcheries. So it's kind of a way to, uh, they're not high value fish, but you know, but they do provide some benefit, but it's a way to uh, kind of return some of those fish to harvest or, um, just before um, they return to the hatcheries kind of at the end of the life cycle. And uh, as I mentioned, these fisheries are managed within the full suite of non-treaty fisheries. Therefore, all of the same uh, non-treaty ESA limits, other constraints apply to these fisheries. So we have to, we, we monitor and manage these fisheries within the context of the, the greater non-treaty fisheries and uh, have to account for harvest of non-local stocks and including ESA listed stocks within these fisheries as well. And that's all I have on that slide. Um, okay. Here's our landing slide for any questions. Great. So this, uh, if I could real quick, this, this slide is, uh, we don't have very many pictures of salmon in the ocean because they're so hard to find. So I, I managed to find this picture, which is a snapshot from a research program that's really interesting. We'd love to talk to you about someday. Uh, we're not directly involved in it, but it was a, a research cruise uh, that was first done in 2019. They went back out again this year uh, looking for juvenile salmon large on the high seas um, and found some fish in places where uh, they normally wouldn't necessarily expect them to be. So very interesting. This is trying to reflect the ocean phase. Normally these fish would have another three to five years to go, but we don't have that long to go to the end of the presentation. But uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but that would be a later presentation maybe, Chris? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I could probably send you a link to the information. As I said, we're not super uh, involved in it directly, so I'm not sure I'd have much to say. It's just, uh, but I could send you some links that are really pretty pretty interesting. And as they continue to do the work, I think we have the potential to... Um, to learn a lot from it as part of what's called the International Year of the Salmon um, Project, which is, uh, well, a large scale sort of uh, project that's kind of worldwide. So, great. Thank you. Commissioners, questions? I have a question or maybe a comment. This is, this is Commissioner Woolley. <clears throat> So uh, thank you for that, Jeff, and it's good to hear about some of those select areas, some of the original ones um, that have been successful. Uh, and, and also let me know, um, Chris, if I'm getting ahead of the program here, but um, I want to address related to select areas, uh, the 2012 Kids Harbor Plan. And so in that plan, there were additional respective select areas that were proposed. Uh, to help support uh, commercial fisheries um, in their their harvest ability as, as a way to help to offset the loss that they would occur uh, from some of the, the plan components that would gradually move a lot of their uh, fishing methods off of the main stem of the Columbia River. And so, you know, we, we found that those new sites were not Majority of them were not viable for for a number of reasons, and and they were uh, very low productivity uh, for commercial fishing fleets. And so, um, do you plan to address um, in in the discussion of select areas anything about those those sites? In other words, the the expectations versus the outcome, and if, what is the outlook for the future? Uh, for select areas moving forward. Sure, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, I, I can try. There's, there's a. Uh, I'll try and be kind of brief. We didn't plan on getting too much more into that in this presentation, um, but it is a, it's a good and a relevant question. Um, we did in the packet um, provide you a link to a couple of compilation reports, one by our staff and one by um, Washington with some of our assistance uh, as well from John and his staff that, that do go into much of that review. 
My recollection is the the plan, the 2012 actions were uh, really structured to identify that we should look for new sites. They didn't have any specifically proposed at the time that I recall. Um, and as part of our transition period work between uh, 2013 and 2016, Oregon in particular did quite a bit of work um, trying to evaluate some some potential areas. Um, Jeff mentioned earlier when he was talking about the map that that you know when um, when the in the mid 90s um, when the expansion um, was being um, worked on, the Oregon went through a pretty extensive evaluation um, process to look for additional sites. So during the transition period, we basically took that up again and sort of uh, said, all right, we've picked the four, three or four or five best sites out of that list. Are there some, you know, maybe second down the list sites we could go look at? Uh, and we also did evaluate for looking for a couple of sites in Washington um, because the, uh, one of the main issues um, under the 2012 discussion was just that uh, as you saw on the map, Washington has one site, um, Deep River. Uh, they've had a, uh, another small site or two historically that didn't work very well that had been discontinued. So we really were hoping we could find something on the Washington side. We actually did, um, I believe, find one that might have some potential, but Washington hasn't really um, picked that up um, to my recollection. And we did find uh, one potential site in Oregon not a great one, but one that we looked at, and um, it's still sort of on the list for a potential down the road, but um, in our adaptive management discussions in 2017, we really focused more on um, trying to add more production to the sites we have now uh, as part of a number of things, um, but in part to offset some of the lack of an additional site as well as some of the other economic um, outcomes that were different than what we thought they might be. Uh, that's a long answer. I don't know if Tucker or John want to add anything to to the sort of additional site evaluation discussion. Sure, Chair. Sure. Well, this is uh, Tucker Jones uh, and Commissioner Woolley. Uh, as Chris said, we did uh, uh, look at additional uh, terminal areas. We also looked at expanding the time uh, and area of the existing spots. Uh, we did fairly extensive investigation of every terminal and off-channel area between uh, Baker Bay and the skipping on down uh, near the mouth all the way up to, to Bonneville Dam. And for, uh, you know, a variety of reasons, there's not a lot of, you know, the best places have been sort of used. The other places uh, have, you know, sort of a suite of issues associated with them. Um, either size or presence of non-local uh, you know stocks as Jeff mentioned you know the idea here is to segregate away from those mixed stocks and, and so if some of these off-channel areas are used pretty regularly as migratory corridors they don't they don't necessarily work that well um, if they're heavily used right it may have a, a good spot that looks like a, a terminal location but if it's got a lot of uh, industrial boat use, uh, right? Like think about the skipping on, uh, yeah, it, may, it might be a terminal area, but a lot of uh, boats in and out of there. So make it hard to use. Now, Chris is right. We did identify a couple areas, Cold Creek uh, Slough uh, in Washington and, uh, and Westport Slough in Oregon. I haven't advanced super far. One of the, the issues there is trying to, to find infrastructure and access and and that has been a little bit challenging on uh, current side, uh, on the Oregon side and West Fork, and, and I don't know that Washington has done anything with Cold Creek. Um, we did, like I said, also look for just expanding the uh, boundaries of the uh, and time uh, for the existing areas. Again, that non-local piece comes into play when you start expanding the boundaries out. They're, they're kind of been uh, set through an adaptive process that really has them optimized for for harvest of locally produced stocks and and non interceptions of uh, of out of area locations. Uh, we have done some expansions on time. We start those fisheries up a little bit earlier in the winter, uh, and we have done more uh, extensions through 
um, uh, the spring and early summer as well. So, um, so I don't know if that helps, Adam. Again, I probably more information than you wanted, but no, it, to it's air on that side today. Yeah, no, it's fine. I think in this case, maybe a little more information is better than less. I, I don't want to dwell on it because you have a lot of presentation to go. But just wanted to let the commissioners know that that, that was part of the component of the plan, and the, you know, there were expectations and maybe some assumptions that haven't really played out and haven't haven't benefit much the, the the commercial industry in ways that maybe we thought it would. So we can move on. Uh, Commissioner Spellbrink, I got a quick question. So we can move on. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if you could hear me or not. Uh, on the uh, on that select fisheries, I see that you know you had that one Thule component of the run. I know that's not a very good quality, you know, commercial fish. Is that to for an, another reason? Those are are raised. Uh, Commissioner uh, Spellbrink, uh, this is Chris. Um, others can chime in. Um, the Thule stockfish are actually. Um, a pretty good component of some of the ocean fisheries, particularly to the north um, off the coast of Washington. And in, in their ocean phase, their quality is is not an issue at all. It's when they start to enter the river that um, because they come in at a, at a later state of maturity that you know, they're, they're not quite as desirable as the upper river brides, but they do support pretty substantial opportunity out there. And so um, that that's part of it. Um, and so the Mitchell Act program production in particular um, helps fund some of that um, and produce those fish for that purpose. And, and Jeff had mentioned some of the actions that have been taken have been to, um, we used to, uh, we, the collective we uh, in the basin used to raise toolies at a number of facilities in the lower river. Uh, and there has been some move of some of that production into these select areas uh, in order to minimize the straying that they used to see when they were being released at other facilities like Bonneville. Um, in particular, uh, as Jeff pointed out, because of a high harvest rate in the terminal area. So um, there's a bit of a mix there. But yeah, there, there, there are substantial fishery benefits, um, not insubstantial in the river, but also quite substantial in the ocean as well. Right, I knew that. I just yeah. wondered if that was the why, why they were still being raised there, and that makes sense. Chris, I have a follow-up question um, on the, the hatchery fish. If you just look, and by the way, the chart in the packet was really helpful to have. If I just pick out one of them, which is the spring chinook, it looks like we've gone from in 2012 to just under a million production. Um, well, that, at least that's the goal, um, to three and a half million, which is quite a chunk or quite a jump in a few years. Do we, is that a good read of what your chart says is the first question. And the second one is, um, do we have a clear idea of the stray rates and the impacts of any of the strays? Um, and then I have one other follow-up question, but I'll save that one. So the, the questions are, do we have a clear idea of the stray rates and the impacts on the, the local um, fisheries? And is that a, a, an accurate read of your chart that it basically tripled, if you will, the hatchery production in the safe area for Spring Chinook? Uh, yeah, so uh, Chair Wall, yeah, yeah, I think it's an accurate picture. I'm not looking at it right now, but... Um, that was, uh, as Commissioner Woolley referenced, um, that was actually in the plan was to increase production of a couple of stocks, in particular Spring Chinook, but not just Spring Chinook, in the areas. Um, those those stocks are um, tagged with coat wire tags and all fin marked, and we do work in our own programs and collectively with the other basin programs to look for any straying issues that may occur with those, so we do routinely assess any stray rates there, they do remain low, um, partly due to that high harvest rate. And then in terms of impacts um, beyond just a, a generic hatchery straying um, side of the equation, the other part that is important with Spring Chinook in the uh, Young's Bay and uh, those lower river select areas on the Oregon side um, is that the Spring Chinook weren't endemic to those locations. And so there isn't a native stock in the basin itself 
of the same kind of fish that would interact genetically with these. So uh, absent a straying to a different basin where there are spring chinook, that, that is obviously something you want to track and be cognizant of and make sure that we're not having adverse effects from. But that's one of the real benefits of the spring stock in those areas is, is they're not uh, native to it. And the, the follow-up is we have, um, you described an impressive harvest rate on those returning ones. My question is about the 10% that, that we don't harvest. What happens to those? Are those straying or? Uh, John or Jeff, do you want to speak to that? I think you might have a, a chance to be actually able to cite some data that I can't pull off the top of my brain. Uh, John or Jeff, do you want to speak to that? I think you might have a, a chance to be able to... Uh, this is John. Uh, I don't have the data in front of me either, but in that safe packet, there's a breakdown of, uh, you know, where the fish end up, who catches them, how many escape. Uh, but the vast majority of the escapement is just going up to terminal hatcheries uh, not far from themselves, so that allows us to sort out those fish. But a very minor percent is actually out of basin drain. Uh, again, I don't have that in front of me, but it's quite low. Um, Thank you. Thanks. That helps. Um, so, it, uh, this is Mark. I have a question yeah. to follow up, if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, so um, I don't know if this is a Chris question, but I was looking at the chart, and it shows like from 2015 to 2017, about 12,000 Chinook were harvested uh, per year on average in um, Young's Bay. So, since this has been in place for quite a while, is that uh, historically about the harvest level, or is it higher, lower? Can you help me there? Well, um, I'll, I'll take a shot at sort of a broad um, uh, shot at addressing that, and John and Jeff actually have the long-term familiarity. I, I, I didn't mention it, but uh, in previous lives, both John and Jeff were actually the project manager for our program in the select area, so they're, they're very intimately uh, knowledgeable about this stuff. The, there are a couple factors to think about when we think about harvest in the select area, particularly for spring. Uh, one is the change in production that's happening over time. So there's some changes uh, that you have to kind of account for when you look at harvest. The other is the fact that no matter what we do with releases, um, those fish are still subject to the same whims and, vari and vagaries of survival in the ocean. And so they will cycle up and down. Uh, some of those numbers you quoted are towards the high end. Uh, in the last couple of years have been pretty darn low. Um, and again, it's it's uh, simply they are they are going to the same place uh, in the ocean that our other stocks that have been cycling are going. So I, John can probably give a maybe a quick read on the what you might think of as harvest uh, over time. John can probably give a maybe a quick read on the yes, commissioners. Um, uh, regarding that question, it, it is a little challenging to look, just look at total Chinook because over time the programs have changed quite a bit and we've shifted some bigger releases of truly Chinook which used to, you know, result in high catches but relatively low value and now we're switching or attempting to switch over to higher production of spring Chinook which uh, have a much higher value per fish. So it's a little challenging to compare. Um, total Chinook, you know, we, in the early parts of the program when it was building, you know, it, was, it was quite low, you know, a thousand fish in the early 90s and progressed fairly steadily up to well over 13,000, 14,000 in the early 2000s. And then we had a really good run during the 2010. Uh, 15 period of over 20,000 a year. And recently, with the four ocean survival, our, our catches have dropped off a fair bit on the Chinook side, but that's, that's what happens. Fish runs go up and down. So I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? If not, let's stop there for 10 minutes. And be back at just let's make it five to three, so just under ten minutes.
just let's make it five to three. Okay, Michelle, are you there? I am here, Bob or Mark. Uh, yeah, can. Uh,
years to measure the survival for out-migrating uh, smolts who may benefit from the spill, uh, but the message, generally speaking, is clear. Increased spill has equaled increased survival. Next. Just real briefly here, you know, we're looking at this through time. There's an ongoing decades-long study. It's a collaborative, uh, you know, it's collaborative work with uh, tribal and state and federal scientists. It's uh, empirically based and, empir and independently reviewed, uh, looking at the effects of spill that we've had in the past and the operations that we've done. Um, you know, the take homes, again, not that hammer away it is, but uh, you get a higher small to adult return with lower powerhouse encounters. Spill is the best way to avoid, uh, you know, powerhouse encounters, I, I guess, except for, you know, essentially uh, breach. And if you're just talking about spill, spill into about 125% of uh, total dissolved gas. So the most currently allowable optimizes uh, survival benefits and potential, uh, you know, negative impacts from a high spill. Next. So just briefly let you know that there's been an ongoing over the last several years uh, Columbia River Systems Operation EIS uh, that was the result of some litigation that Oregon and, and this person were part of. That uh, EIS was released last Friday in its final form, along with um, along with a, a hydro biop from the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, and a corresponding uh, biop from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Although, as Chris mentioned, the Fish and Wildlife Service are mostly focused on bull trout uh, and uh, in our area, and also, I guess, Kootenai River white sturgeon, but that's much higher in the system. Um, we're looking at, at several of the alternatives that were considered in that process. Uh, they had a, a power-focused option. Uh, there are no options. No action alternative was associated with the biop that we litigated on uh, in 2014. Uh, the flexible spill operation, which people maybe have heard a little bit about, that 125% uh, 24-hour spill. Uh, a breach option, which they, uh, the action agencies considered in the EIS uh, at the direction uh, of the courts. And then actually a, one that wasn't necessarily increased, uh, an operation that wasn't considered in the EIS, but was put together by some of the groups that were trying to look for a, maybe a true environmentally preferred option, which would be a breach of those four Snake River dams plus 125% spill. The top figure, we're looking at uh, the probability um, that we would see those SARs of less than 1%. Remember, that's associated with pretty serious uh, uh, population decline, and in the bottom figure, we're looking at the probability of getting SARS with a, a given option um, uh, of greater than 2%, and that's what we need for increasing uh, populations and recovery. Uh, and you can see that, uh, you know, with the proposed operation, you know, we're, we're looking at SARS of, of less than 1%, you know, 36 to 39% of the time, and, and only about 40% of the time, again, would you expect above 2%. To get really into those ranges you need on the probability front, uh, you need some sort of more aggressive actions. Uh, this actually becomes especially important when you start to think about uh, future climate change scenarios. Um, really, the only one that keeps us above uh, sort of the Frequently in the less than 1% are some of these breach options, though the 125% can keep you close uh, at 24 hours a day. Um, again, the proposed, the preferred alternative and the proposed action uh, are that uh, flexible spill operation that we've been in under the last several years, which uh, the region sort of agreed to. Uh, with the caveat that everybody kind of thought more was going to need to be done eventually, uh, but that we needed time to work on that EIS and the proposed action. Next. Uh, 
Next slide. Ah. All right, sorry, just uh, try to cram in a lot of information on this in a, in a short amount of time. But uh, I guess take homes, you know, really, like I said, hydro and fish are good for the region. Uh, we're really trying to balance fish and power moving forward. Spill has been good for fish. It's, uh, it's, it's great for power because, you know, as I said, that water coming down the system has got to take one, you know, really one of two routes. And if you're not sending it through the powerhouse, it's, uh, you know, foregone opportunity to generate power. Um, there have been some changing power markets, you know, that have come along with the surge of renewables and, uh, and energy efficiency, and they provided, I guess, I think, for that flexible spill agreement, the opportunity to increase spill for fish uh, conservation benefits without, in those times, increasing power costs, uh, as I said, while they were working on finalizing that uh, EIS. That being said, the flexible spill operation alone is not adequate to recover salmon. The NEPA, the final EIS, and the biological opinions uh, that were released last Friday, they do identify that flexible spill operation as the proposed alternative. Um, and, you know, myself and, and some of my other staff, not necessarily the fisheries guys, though they're going to be weighing pieces of it also, are going to be uh, doing a pretty intensive review in the coming weeks. The biop itself was about 1,500 pages with, I think, a thousand pages in, a, in appendices, and the EIS is even longer with more appendices. So uh, there's going to be quite a bit uh, of work to look on that. Uh, now this is uh, really, I know it, it can seem daunting. It's a, a complex, but a, an incredibly important topic. Uh, I know I've only really had a time here to give you a small introduction to it. Um, but uh, but hydro actions are, are really important uh, to ESA recovery and broad sense recovery in the basin. And so with that, I guess I'd be happy to take any questions now. Uh, you're also welcome to reach out to me whenever you want, if this, uh, if this seems like a lot right now. Uh, just a quick question uh, from me, this is Commissioner Woolley. So I remember there was a time when there was some experimentation with, you know, barging and trucking juveniles around these um, these barriers, and it's it's kind of fallen off the discussion now. And I, I know that there were some problems with that, but I'm just kind of curious what what ended up um, happening, you know, sort of what was the conclusion about the success or lack of of, of transporting juveniles around around dams and and why that doesn't work. Uh, Commissioner Woolley, uh, there still is barging activities and uh, to a much lesser extent uh, some trucking transportation uh, around the hydro system. The, the trucks usually uh, only go at the very beginning or very end of the season when numbers are, are quite low. Um, early on, that was sort of thought to be the answer and a very high proportion of, uh, of fish uh, in the 90s were barged. Uh, 80, 90 percent of the fish encountered at those upper dams. There's been a real de-emphasis on that uh, approach, and so now, uh, but there's still been, um, I guess, a, a balance the risk approach across the basin. I haven't gone away from transportation entirely. Uh, for, for some species in certain conditions, it can be, uh, you know, better, but if uh, so if the river is a pretty inhospitable place, then transportation can uh, work a little bit better than, than there. Also, when fish do encounter a powerhouse, uh, sort of the thought has been, so, you know, they've gone through the bypass, they've gone through a powerhouse, let's, um, you know, put them on the boat and move them down so that they're not going to experience any other powerhouses uh, on the way out. But there are issues associated with that. Survival rates have not been great for transported fish compared to, you know, those fish that never ex experience powerhouses. Uh, those transported fish experience a, a quite a bit uh, higher degree of straying as opposed to fish that uh, 
that migrate through the system, and, and that has to do with those fish are, are sort of in the river and moving down, and, and they're not getting a chance to imprint on those uh, tributaries that they would otherwise encounter as, as a migrant out the system. So they're not getting the full map, so to speak, on their way out. They're, they're having to find their way back, and, and they stray more uh, in general. And then for some fish, we find that, that survival can uh, impacts can stay with you clear into adults from transported fish. In, in 2015, uh, you know, sockeye had a, a pretty tough go of it, people probably remember. Uh, but those sockeye that were transported uh, as juveniles died at an even higher rate than those sockeye that, that uh, migrated out of the system. So, you know, I, I think in general, the region's still on this balance, the risk, but a uh, lot of negatives associated with barging. In general, uh, the best approach is to, to the river uh, mimic, you know, as close as possible a natural river. So uh, decrease that water transit time, try to keep temperatures cooling um, as cool as possible, uh, keep the fish in the river and avoid in the powerhouses. Thanks, Tucker. Anyone other commissioners? Tucker, I have one question. The, um, that was a remarkably concise description, I think, of spills, breaching, SARS, and what's going on. The, the next step of reviewing the, all those documents, what's the likely outcome? What are the options other than sticking with, you know, I know that you know, maybe the, the easiest one would be sticking right where we are, could be the outcome. But what what do you see going forward? Well, right now, I think it, it's, uh, it's evaluating what's in there. As I said, they're pretty big documents. There's a lot of information contained within. Uh, I don't think right, that they go as far as we'd hoped that they were going to look towards uh, some of the recovery options. Um, but we're working in a lot of venues uh, with uh, co-managers in the region and our federal partners and, and trying to figure out uh, exactly what those options are. And I think there are, there are quite a few and a lot of, and all of them are still uh, pretty wide open at this point in time. Okay, thank you, thanks. I have a question. Um, so it looks like if uh, if the um, biop stands with the flex option, that um, that puts a lot more pressure on harvest, um, so that the the uh, sport and commercial fisheries might be impacted more because we're losing more um, fish through the spill and keeping the fish in ESA essentially status. Is that, would you say that's one of the impacts? Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, I don't, I think it's a, a pretty nuanced question. Uh, we've definitely, uh, you know, moved things forward and so we're, we're trying to make things better with the ultimate goal being broad sense uh, recovery. You know, sometimes like Sisyphus though, it seems like, you know, rolling the ball up the hill is an eternal journey. Uh, but we are further up the hill. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about those down cycles and, and I came in and said, you know, hey, listen, we're trying to, what we're trying to do is make the floor of those cycles higher and I think we are doing that, and we are incrementally making things better. But ultimately, right, what we want is broad sense recovery. And when I say that, I mean not just, uh, you know, above the very bare minimums that aren't going to go extinct, uh, but that, you know, replacing essentially what was lost so that, uh, you know, healthy and harvestable populations exist throughout the basin, uh, for the tribes and non-tribal people, uh, satisfy cultural, ecological, economic, 
a goal. And so, you know, I, I don't think that this operation probably gets us there yet. Um, what are the options out there moving forward? I, I think we're still exploring those uh, and looking for ways to, you know, the ball up the hill. So, Tucker, I have a question. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. We know that all the H's are important. So, but if you were king of the world, what would be your priority in terms of the H's, in terms of recovering fish in the Columbia River system? Which would be the highest priority, second, third, fourth? Well, that is putting me a little bit on the spot, Commissioner Lavhart, Chair Wall. Uh, I think that you know the hydro system has very heavily impacted these fish destined for interior basins um, but there are listed populations downstream of the hydro system and i would be remiss to note and so i think that you know hydro is probably you know in my opinion the, the top thing that we're looking to decrease all of them you know if you're if you're from a, the grand ronde basin Right. No matter how good, you know, to put it in simple tone terms, if we fix all that habitat up and it's great, you still got to run the gauntlet to get uh, to the ocean and back again. So uh, I guess I would say hydro, and then you know there's been pretty significant habitat impacts, uh, and those need to be addressed. Um, I think that that in the past. Fisheries impacts and harvests have, you know, definitely played their part. I think as they currently exist, though, uh, if you think about that example that Chris showed when we were talking about, uh, you know, fisheries impacts and, and how we're thinking about conservation, right? When you're harvesting less than two percent, that is not high on the overall impact list uh, compared to some of the other things. And I think that you know hatcheries are an important component of, of these things, right? Keeping, uh, you know, we use hatcheries in a couple of ways. One, we have some integrated conservation programs, uh, but also we use those as a, an opportunity to provide harvest. And and you know, you'll probably hear me say this again tomorrow. You've probably heard me say it in the past, uh, but I think that you know conservation and opportunity to go fishing are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I think they're kind of mutually linked. Um, you need an actively engaged base uh, to really advance on some of these conservation issues. Anglers, in my experience, are incredibly conservation minded. And it keeps people, I think, tied to the resource to a degree when you give them an opportunity uh, to go out and fish and fishing is not just about it's not just about catching it's about being out there right it's being there it's being in that sense of place it ties you to the world it grounds you to a little bit um, so if, if you sort of take those opportunities if people lose that connection then they're not going to be the advocates that we need uh, to sort of advance these conservation issues and i think hatcheries play a really important part in that uh, so, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, well, you, just, you just saw an, a big news release here about the Land and Water Conservation Fund and how many hundreds of millions of dollars are going to be coming out uh, to help with that. And, and BPA funding, you know, um, as I understand, BPA funding is either flat or going down. And it seems like, you know, for hatcheries and um, Habitat and you know a number of the H's uh, BPA funding has been a, a big help in the past and continues to be a help is where, where do you is, is that funding flat or is it going down or is there an opportunity for us as commissioners to continue lobbying our congressional delegation for increased BPA funding kind of like that land and water conservation fund for infrastructure for bringing some of these species back from where they are now. Yeah. Yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, uh, yeah, uh, Bonneville uh, Power Administration has been a, a primary uh, you know, funder of a lot of the conservation 
efforts going out there. They have a, a pretty big mitigative responsibility. Um, you know, one of the terms you hear us use sometimes are the action agencies. When we say that, we're referring to the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, U.S. Corps of Eng Army Corps of Engineers, and Bonneville Power. Um, Bonneville's in charge of marketing the power, and so they've been in charge of, of funding a lot of the mitigation for the construction and continued operation of the system. Uh, of late, they have uh, really been working aggressively to keep uh, the size of their fish and wildlife program, which, uh, you know, to be fair, is, is substantial uh, to the tune of about $250 million a year currently. But flat or below uh, inflationary increases, um, in the last several years, you know, Oregon Fish and Wildlife Projects have definitely been held flat. And economics genius to know that the flat funding over the course of time is actually you know, functional budget cuts uh, because inflation is a real thing and the the size of that dollar decreases over time. Uh, I will say, looking at uh, you know Bonneville's proposed rate cases, uh, moving into the this next proposed rate case, uh, it's not just over overall for the Fish and Wildlife Program. Uh, it's not just a, a cut in uh, in functional dollars in real dollars in terms of inflation, right? It's not just flat funding, but it's actual uh, a decrease in nominal dollars too that they're proposing to be spending. So. Uh, yeah, those funds are, are definitely decreasing. Thank you, Chucky. Anyone else? I, I just have a follow-up comment, really. Um, Tucker, I think this is Jill. Uh, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Uh, I think you actually, with Mark's question, you answered what I was getting at on um, looking at the the flex option for the flow, and that is that we need to protect, keep protecting the harvest portion of it and work hard to get that flow up uh, so that we have um, a higher percentage of fish making it out to the sea. So that's, uh, that's what I was getting at. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair Wall, um, this is Kurt. I, yeah. I actually I actually had a couple of questions for Tucker, and then also um, uh, well, I'll start with just a comment. And uh, the comment is that over the last um, you know three decades, uh, Oregon Oregon has really been one of the leaders in advocating for improvements in um, fish survival at these facilities and. It's really been one of the fun, you know, it's the fundamental tenet that, um, you know, we, we believe that uh, improving the overall survival floats everyone's boat. So it's not about more fish for this group or that group. It's about uh, more and better fish populations for everyone. Um, and, you know, I think that's really important. But then the questions for Tucker, and of course now my phone is ringing while I'm trying to talk, so. <laughs> I'm being distracted, but uh, uh, the the two questions for Tucker are: your this um, this portion of the slide deck has really been focused on juvenile survival, and perhaps it's coming up, and you can you can say that it's coming up. But uh, can you talk also a little bit about uh, impact on adult returns because there is both losses, intersystem losses at each facility on the upstream side not just on the downstream juvenile side and then uh, also we, we talked we heard from chris a little bit earlier about um how most of the uh, perhaps all of the harvest management components are now scaled to abundance that is when the runs are are small we're even more restrictive when the runs are large we're, we provide more opportunity and uh, could you talk a little bit about whether um, there's any type of that approach applied as it relates to a hydro system operation. Okay, so, um, so yeah, a lot of what I talked about was about still for getting juvenile fish down, but what we're really focused on is sort of the life cycle survival. Uh, 
you know, there are certainly there are impacts uh, from the hydro system on adults migrating upstream. Uh, it's uh, energetically costly to try to extend those ladders. Um, the reservoirs serve as, um, you know, solar sinks, solar radiation sinks, so they increase temperature there. Uh, you can get thermal blockages at those places. Uh, so there's definitely an impact there. Uh, you know, occasionally you can look at things where you think that uh, spill might be causing uh, a slowdown in the delay of adults, but we don't generally see survival issues associated with spill and adults. Um, and, and I think it's really important to, to try to like, as much as we want to like partition those into juveniles versus adults, it's really important to think about the productivity overall and that lifetime survival rate, that small to adult return rate. Uh, so that when you're not, you're not just, uh, you know, when, you, when you're making those trade-offs in season, if you think you're trying to, to make an operation to make adults better, if you're decreasing juvenile survivals, you're sort of all. Um, uh, and so, yeah, there are definitely impacts to adults through the system. It's part of that overall small to adult rate, that overall productivity and survival rate. Um, and it's all part of what we're advocating for is in terms of increased survival. As far as, you know, there's not really a, we definitely, we, we scale our harvest to those rates. Uh, the system doesn't have the same sort of scale to a uh, rate, right? I mean, if we are going to reach an ESA impact, um, then we shut off a fishery. But the same is not true. Uh, if the hydro, the hydro system doesn't have a, a limit that if they reach, they're going to turn off the hydro system. So, and I don't know if I was getting at that question accurately or if I, I heard it right. So sorry if I got that wrong. No, that was my point. Thanks. Great. Anyone so, else? Uh, Chair Wall, this is Chris. If I could just um, real quick and I, we're, yeah. we're, we're uh, probably going to need to pick it up a little bit, but I think um, I'd be a little remiss uh, in the discussion of hydro and hatcheries in particular, as well as harvest. Uh, and of course, I, well, I don't want to exclude habitat, but uh, the conversation about hatcheries and the role they can play, and this also applies to improve survival and improve through the hydro system and improve productivity through habitat. Um, we tend to think of those from the non-treaty side fairly often for pretty obvious reasons. It's kind of our central focus most of the time. But those issues also create very significant issues for our, our the treaty tribes. And in particular, the ability of the, uh, um, to meet their reserved fishing rights and associated benefits that they've historically um, been dependent and um, and very intricately linked to. So. You know, the sort of um, message I hear fairly consistently from my tribal partners that we work with is, is, you know, at the time of treaty signing and also when the dams were constructed, they were promised that salmon would always be here to meet their needs. Uh, and so the, the ability to meet those needs uh, is not dissimilar from the recovery actions we talk about for, four, eight, for the 4-H's. Um, those are also necessary to meet their needs which are treaty reserved through promise and direct um, agreement with the federal government so just wanted to make sure we flag that that uh, is an important part um, to just kind of keep in mind thank you good point anyone else should we go on then chris Certainly. Um, we're getting ready to move into more of the fishery specific descriptions and we've tried to shorten this up some. Um, we've structured it um, similar. You'll see sort of a re repetition of this general approach um, for the next several slides. And I believe Jeff was going to start us off um, with uh, this section. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. This is Jeff Whistler again. And uh, this is a fairly lengthy sesh section here, um, but it's worth spending a little bit of time on. We're going to get into kind of some of the nuts and bolts about the management 
structure that's employed on an annual basis uh, for fisheries in the Columbia River. Uh, so there's there are three basic management periods that we work within, and these are primarily structured around Chinook harvest periods. The, the Columbia River has historically been a Chinook producing system, therefore fisheries are are focused on on Chinook, and it kind of plays out in how how the the management structure has, has been uh, developed here over time as well. There, I, I will point out that there are other species um, where, where the management of, of those will span these uh, particular management periods. Uh, for example, steelhead and sockeye do not follow this this management uh, approach. Just to lay layer another. Uh, level of complexity to on the, onto the whole thing. Um, I'll also mention that uh, John had, had shown the slide earlier in the presentation on the management cycle. So essentially there's one of these management cycles that occurs for each of these three periods. And although we can talk about them in kind of nice little boxes, that management cycle overlaps significantly uh, during the year. Uh, for example, when we are in the, the heat of our spring fishery in-season management, we are also uh, deep into the pre-season fishery development for, for summer and fall seasons as well. So there's a, a lot of overlap here, but we're going to break it apart and talk about the components uh, separately here. So uh, we'll move on to spring and just a little bit of background on spring season fisheries. These occur in the time frame from the first of the year to mid-June. Uh, and, and I'll point out that even though the, the management, um, the season structure has these date ranges, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that fisheries are static throughout this time period. Uh, as fish move through, there's, there's peak periods and, and low periods. So opportunity is not equal throughout uh, these time frames. Um, so for spring, spring season fisheries, uh, prior to the turn of the century, fisheries for spring chinook in the main stem were, were quite limited. As Director Melcher mentioned earlier, uh, primarily due to um, severely depressed runs of upriver destined spring chinook. And when I, meet, when I say upriver, I'm talking about fish that are destined for areas to return to areas um, upstream of Bonneville Dam. Uh, for example, uh, he, he pointed out the 1995 uh, low point, but for example, average return of these upriver uh, spring Chinook for the, the last half of, of the 90s was about 56,000 total fish. And then, uh, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, so the fisheries pretty much progressed under permanent rule open from January through the end of March in the area downstream of the I-5 bridge only. And that was that was intended to uh, focus harvest on low river stocks, uh, primarily Willamette River origin spring Chinook, but also uh, fish returning to uh, Washington side tributaries, Cowlitz, Kalama, and, and Lewis specifically. And and essentially the, the season was, the recreational season was ended um, prior to um, peak abundance of, of upriver fish um, in the system. And then right around the turn of the century, uh, we started seeing great improvements in, in the upriver runs uh, specifically. The, the first half of the 2000s uh, averaged over 285,000 fish, adults returning. Contrast that with the 56,000 um, in the prior five years. In those years, we, we actually saw two of the record returns, uh, 2001 and 2002. Uh, so the combination of improved runs and the other thing that was happening at the same time was the advent of uh, fin marking of hatchery origin uh, fish uh, throughout the basin. It was, was really just starting at this time. And by 2000, I believe, the majority of Willamette origin fish were the hatchery fish were, were fin marked and upriver stocks were, be, were, were being more and more uh, fin marked on a more regular basis as well. And so that 
allowed us to use a, a different tool, Mark Selective Fisheries, uh, to both expand the time frame of the fisheries and the area itself. Uh, so we were able to expand harvest into April, May time frame, uh, even June a little bit, and areas upstream of, of I-5 and also the, the areas upstream of, of Bonneville as well. And uh, the first uh, main stem, uh, Mark Selective Regulations for Recreational Fisheries went into effect in 2001. And uh, at that same time, we were, you know, sport fisheries, uh, Mark Selective Regulation is relatively easy. Uh, an angler catches a fish, they can identify visually whether it's fin marked or not, and, and can, make, can decide whether it's allowable for them to keep that fish or not. Uh, commercial fisheries were a little more complex. We expended a lot of energy, a lot of research during the same time frame to develop mark selective techniques for main stem commercial fisheries. And the first pilot fishery uh, commercial wise that, that employed mark selective uh, techniques uh, occurred as a pilot fishery in 2001 and the first full fleet fishery occurred in 2002. Move on to the next slide, then. The, um, during the spring season, the, the, the primary uh, focus is on harvest of hatchery produced uh, spring Chinook, both, both lower river and, and upper river origin stocks. Um, as always in the Columbia, we're managing to the weak stock. Um, the key constraining stocks during this, this time frame in, are primarily. Um, upriver origin, uh, ESA listed Upper Columbia Spring Chinook, which are listed as endangered, and Snake River Spring Summer uh, ESU, which is listed as threatened. But we also have lower river stocks that are, that are listed as well, Upper Willamette, and uh, the Lower Columbia River Chinook ESU uh, contains spring component as well, mostly on the Washington side. So at times there are there are is the need to uh, consider those stocks and, and fisheries have been constrained to reduce uh, harvest on, on those stocks as well. For example, the 2008 and 2009 fisheries were constrained to uh, areas upstream of the Willamette River mouth to reduce uh, um, encounters with Willamette origin fish, which were uh, pretty low at that point in time. And then just these last two years, um, We've had uh, in 19 and, and 20 here, we, we've had to constrain fisheries upstream of the, the Lewis River mouth uh, to reduce uh, encounters of fish returning to uh, Washington side tributaries. I'll move to the next slide now. Um, the next two slides are I want to spend a little bit of time on because these are important concepts and they're unique to spring season management specific to upriver origin spring Chinook, uh, which are managed under the USV Oregon Management Agreement. And uh, so two concepts here I want to cover. Uh, they're both uh, embedded in the current management agreement. This first idea of the run size buffer uh, was introduced two years into the prior agreement, the 2008 through 17 agreement. Um, there was some renegotiation that happened around 2010 to insert this language into the agreement, and it's uh, continued on into the into the current agreement. And so we, we provided an example here, but essentially, management of spring fisheries. Um, it now is required to take into account uncertainty and forecasting. Uh, and this is, again, specific to the upriver origin uh, fish. And as we've discussed a little bit, there we do have the ability to update abundance projections in season. But prior to that point, and the fish tell us when that is, you know, we, we don't get we don't get to pick a date and say we're going to update the run now. It, it is dependent on, on how the fish are returning in any given year. But generally speaking, that in-season update will occur uh, early to mid-May. Um, so prior to that point where we can, where we have the ability to uh, assess 
the the return uh, using in season real time information. Uh, there's this desire uh, amongst the U.S. and Oregon parties to to hedge against uncertainty in the forecast. And so to do that, the the preseason forecast is buffered by 30 percent. And so the, the example we presented here, um, well, is of a, a preseason forecast 218,000. So for fishery non-treaty fisheries prior to a run size update, we will assume that run is 70% of forecast and we will base all of our management um, on the run size that's reduced. So 152,600 in this particular example. And in your packet, I think you have a copy of the harvest rate schedule um, associated with upriver spring Chinook. Uh, for the most part, the, the selection criteria uh, to determine the the maximum allowable, allowable ESA impact is based on the aggregate run, but uh, just be aware there are secondary triggers um, embedded in there for uh, abundance of Snake River Wild and Upper Columbia River Wild abundances as well. But assuming that's not part of the the, the, the situation in this particular example, a uh, a forecast of 218,000 or a return of 218,000 would allow non-treaty fisheries a maximum of 2% um, impact on the listed components. By employing this run size buffer, it drops that abundance down into a lower tier. And so we'll be managing uh, to not exceed 1.9 um, until and unless we're, we're able to verify preseason forecast uh, was accurate. And uh, so the two pieces here, it's the, the ESA impact piece, but it's also the, the, um, the, the run size abundance that's being used to develop harvestable allocations as well. So, it, it has, so it's, there's a dual effect that's, that's occurring here. The, the impact rate can be reduced, but also the abundance, therefore the allowable harvest will be reduced as well until we have the ability in season to, to verify or, or update the expected abundance. And at that point, we will manage to whatever that in season expectation is. So, so as far as, as um, effects to the listed fish themselves, it's greater than just a 30% reduction um, because of that, the, the ch potential changes in the allowable impact rates as, as we move up and down the harvest rate schedule. And then the next aspect is the concept of catch balancing. So this is also in the USV Oregon Management Agreement written in. And uh, essentially, the requirement is non-treaty catches or total harvest mortality cannot exceed treaty allowable um, mortalities. The ESA piece is still in play but there's this catch balancing component here too, which is uh, the intent here is to maintain catch equity with, with the treaty tribes um, in the face of marked selective fisheries, which provide the ability to uh, more effectively harvest hatchery origin fish at any given uh, allowable ESA rate. So since, since the ESA listed fish are being released and not directly harvested, the, the mortalities accrue at a lower rate than the harvest of hatchery origin fish would. And so to maintain a catch equity with the tribes, this catch balancing um, um, concept is, is, has been employed. And uh, so for example, that we've given here, same run size, at that given run size, the treaty harvest rate is 10%, which means they can harvest up to 21,800 fish. Therefore, the non-treaty catch cannot exceed 21,800, even if the ESA limit has not been, been met. Um, and more often than not, for spring season fisheries, catch balancing uh, 
idea here is more constraining than ESA. It, it, it will depend on on uh, what gear types are used and, and the kind of the suite of fisheries that, that we've employed at the time, but more often than not, catch balancing will be uh, more constraining. So uh, most of the time, the ESA limits will not um, will not even meet the threshold of, of what is allowable. And so as commissioners, this is important to keep in mind when you're um, talking about um, or dealing with allocations of, of impacts amongst user groups, the effect is not going to be the, the effect uh, to harvest or allowable harvest will not be linear if you move uh, the ESA impact from one side to the other. It's not, not a linear relationship with the number of fish that would be harvested in there. There's just there's more at play. It, it, it's the gears that are in place, the, the catch balance piece of it as well. So spring fisheries management is is pretty complicated and, and doesn't always uh, seem to make sense on, on the face of it. But uh, it's just because of all these different pieces that are that are um, in play here. Next slide then, Chris. As far as process goes for spring season uh, fisheries, uh, initial forecasts will be produced uh, by mid-December. Uh, U.S. Bureau Oregon TAC produces some of those. Uh, agencies um, will produce others. For example, the Willamette Spring Chinook forecast uh, is, is done in-house by ODFW. WDFW will produce forecasts for for returns uh, to their tributaries. And then uh, that whole suite of forecasts um, will go into play, come into play when we're, we're uh, beginning our, our process of developing initial season structures. Um, so after the forecasts are available, then we move into this, you know, incorporating all of the direction and, and uh, constraints under USB Oregon, ESA, everything else will develop um, reasonable season structures. And then we'll meet with our uh, advisory groups, both commercial and recreational advisory groups, to bounce ideas, uh, get feedback off of, and then we'll refine those proposals and then make it the, the formal recommendation at a, a compact or joint state hearing. Uh, for select area fisheries, typically that one will occur in late January, early February. And for the main stem recreational fisheries, uh, we, last few years at least, we've, we've done that in, in late February. And so at that hearing, ODFW, WDFW representatives uh, decide on what the season structure will be. And then as described Earlier, the states uh, have to implement uh, state-specific rules in, in order to, to codify that decision. And then as commissioners, you will generally see the first set of rules at your March meeting. But uh, as described before, uh, there's a lot of in-season management that will occur as well. And so you'll likely see uh, updates to those rules and making changes uh, through your June and July meetings also. And with that, I think we're on a, another landing slide here with the beautiful dogwood blooming, letting us know that uh, spring Chinook are peaking in the river. And I'll uh, take any questions on the spring component, if there are any. Commissioners, are you, you have questions? Or are we gonna let Jeff off? I, I have uh, one quick question. Um, so if looking at that catch balancing um, and the uh, both treaty and non-treaty are limited to 21,800 in your example, um, would that likely actually harvest all the hatchery fish that were needed to be harvested? Or, and if it's not, is there uh, an additional adjustment so that there more har uh, hatchery fish can be harvested. Sure, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, so, 
in the main stem, both treaty and non-treaty fisheries are constrained by ESA limitations. And so what that catch balancing is doing is, is basically uh, identifying the, the cap that treaty fisheries uh, would be able be allowed to harvest uh, while while not exceeding their ESA uh, impact to the listed stocks. So, so that's just a there's just a straight limitation there because of the the mixed stock nature of, of main stem fisheries in the Columbia. There will be uh, hatchery fish that escape main stem fisheries. Uh, some of that's needed to maintain. Um, hatchery brood stock, of course, but then there are also uh, tributary fisheries that don't have the same specific ESA limitations. You know, again, with that kind of terminal area harvest concept, there are tributary fisheries that can um, exact additional harvest on on the hatchery origin fish at, after they move out of the main stem and into into the tributaries. Okay, thank you. So Jeff, um, I just have a comment here because I think this is a good timing for this comment. I was going to make it toward the end, but um, your presentation um, highlights for me the, the concern that, that I hear out there. And that is that um, I hear a lot about, well, the regulations are too strict. Uh, we need to simplify the regulations. Um, Bill Moreau had an article recently, I think, from the Oregonian talking about all the different regulations up and down the river for specific points. And, you know, you mentioned the March would get the original allocation and they will be making multiple changes in June and July. And, you know, it's and, and for the for, for you know, you know this and I think the rest of the public knows this. We're, we're trying our best to protect the stocks and increase the amount of fisheries that we have in the Columbia River, but still allowing for harvest. And in order to do that, you've just outlined how much detail you have to go into to make sure that those stocks are protected, to make sure that we follow treaty regulations, to make sure that we're concurrent with Oregon and Washington, and, the, and all the other criteria that go into trying to make tough decisions on fisheries in the Columbia River system and that we know that they're difficult and we know that they're complicated but it's the best that we can do as scientists or you know as biologists that are out there to try to protect those stocks and increase those stocks as best we can but still allow for harvest and so that's why the, the regulations aren't simple. And so, you know, I, I watch TV shows that said, oh, the Columbia is being so complicated, I can't understand it. They've got all these restrictions on the size of the hooks and the, and the amount of fish and where they can go and all those kind of things. So uh, I hope uh, that folks that are watching this can understand at least the, the hard decisions and choices that you as biologists are making uh, that give us those policy decisions so that we can protect those stocks and allow for harvest throughout the river system. So thanks for allowing me to, uh, to rant just a little bit. Uh, the Chair, while this is Chris, I, if I could just a real quick comment on that, if I might. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an excellent point, Commissioner Labhart, and, and it is, there is obviously a, um, a balance point we try to achieve between not being overly complex, but also trying to um, squeeze as much opportunity as we can out with, within the conservation bounds. Often we're put in the place of actually pushing back on public proposals to do even more complicated rules to squeeze, you know, one more day here or there. Um, and so it does go both ways. It's a push and pull. Uh, it would be quite simple to have a very, very restrictive fishery that was really simple. Um, and uh, but our opportunity to have a simple regulation that is at the same time liberal is pretty rare. So are we ready to move on? Do we still have audio? Am I still there? 
Yeah. Let's move on. We may have lost uh, Chair Walk momentarily. So, okay. So let's keep going. Um, I'll move on here. Um, I will recommend that we try and, um, on the staff side, try and uh, summer's going to be a little briefer than spring. Spring's pretty complex. Uh, we are lagging, I think, a little behind. Um, so. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Chris. I, I did want to spend a little bit of time on spring there because it does Absolutely. get so much, so much uh, air time, you know. Uh, but the same kind of construct here for, for summer management period uh, that begins mid June, runs through the end of July. Uh, these fisheries were, were closed for most of the latter half of the, of the 20th century. Um, as you can see on the screen there from 1965 through 2002, uh, targeted fisheries for summer Chinook were closed. Uh, we did have ongoing uh, uh, some steelhead fisheries uh, during this time that are quite popular, but uh, did not have the opportunity to to target summer chinook during this time frame um, then. Uh, but kind of similar to spring, there are significant rebuilding efforts, uh, increased hatchery production in, in the upper basin. I mean, the, and again, we're talking about upper Columbia summer chinook here. So these are, are Washington populations originating uh, areas upstream of Priest Rapids Dam. And so because of increased abundance and, and also the advent of, of Mark Selective Fisheries as well, uh, we were able to provide limited recreational opportunity beginning in 2002 and a commercial opportunity on, on these fish uh, starting in 2005. And, uh, and up through 2016, we, had, we were able to have both uh, um, commercial and main and recreational opportunity on on these fish. Move to the next one. The this so like I like I mentioned, uh, these fisheries are are focused on uh, Upper Columbia summer chinook, which are not listed. We spoke a little bit about this earlier. This is the one stock that. Um, while there are ESA limitations, uh, the, the last bullet there um, shows we've got, you know, wild summer steelhead and Snake River sockeye. Uh, so there are limitations on, on impacts to those species. Uh, as far as summer Chinook go, uh, it's, uh, it's more of a quota based uh, management um, that, that some folks are more used to, um, which is one of the unique situations in the Columbia where, where we've got that. Um, approach employed. And uh, as Chris had, had mentioned earlier in the presentation, harvest of these fish are, are structured to achieve specific uh, escapement goals of aggregate wild and hatchery uh, fish into the spawner areas and the hatcheries. Um, and so the, the harvestable surplus is, is the difference between the, the actual return and, and uh, the escapement goal. <clears throat> And move to the approach. And uh, yeah, so I, I just covered that first point there. Uh, we, the harvest rate schedule is, is in your packet. Uh, this is also a component of the USV Oregon Management Agreement. Uh, summer Chinook management is, is strange in that harvest in non treaty PFMC area ocean fisheries is counted against the overall non-treaty uh, harvestable allocation. Um, again, to kind of meet some of that harvest equity with the tribes who, the Columbia River Treaty tribes who would do not fish in the ocean, but, but we have treaty fisheries in the ocean that harvest these fish. And uh, the other interesting component to this one is uh, an agreement that WDFW has with the Colville tribe to allocate um, uh, in river surpluses to areas upstream of, of PRD. And I believe that is also in your packet. But uh, essentially, that agreement uh, reserves between 60 and 90% of the harvestable surplus available to in river fisheries, uh, specifically to Washington State and Colville and Wanapum tribal fisheries upstream and, and near uh, Priest Rapids Dam. and, and that is an, another abundance-based scales, high abundances. They reserve 60% at low abundances. They reserve uh, essentially all of them. And so in the last uh, 
well, last year specifically in preseason this year, uh, the expected return was was low enough that we didn't have uh, the opportunity for directed uh, fisheries directed on, on Upper Columbia Summer Chinook uh, in our fisheries downstream of Priest Rapids Dam, including the lower river. And next slide is the annual process. Um, this one is, is uh, linked a bit to the North of Falcon process because of that uh, nexus with ocean harvest. And so TAC produces these, these forecasts in December along with the spring chinook forecasts. And that provides an additional, initial abundance estimate to start working with and, and planning initial season structures. That is all done through the North of Falcon process, which John talked about earlier. Um, uh, several public meetings that go along with that process to uh, to bounce back, bounce side, the concepts in the, the structures uh, between the public and, and the managers. And then again, uh, state of Oregon would implement uh, whatever fishery structure is, is agreed to, um, the emergency rule. And then as commissioners, you would generally see these uh, in, in late spring. I think those, those temp rules are, are filed um, typically May, May-ish time frame, and then any changes you would see uh, in the in your temporal packets uh, through about your August meeting. Sorry, I jumped the gun on you there, Jeff. No, that's all right. <laughs> Everybody likes to see these big June hogs, right? And uh, yeah. and then of course that's Grand Coulee there, so which blocked their migration. So. I'll take any questions on summer, and then I think John's going to pick up uh, starting with, with fall management period here. Any questions, commissioners? I think we're ready to go with yours, John, then. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Wall, Director Malcher, and Commissioner. This is John Northman, and I'll cover the next two sections pertaining to fall seasons and white season. Now, our fall summer season, you know, technically occurs from August 1 to the end of the year, but the majority of that harvest occurs in August through October, and uh, focusing on healthy wild chinook and happy origin chinook and happy coho as well as happy steelhead for recreational fisheries. Uh, the, the recreational fisheries we do manage in several sub areas through the different run time and some stock components in the catch. Most of the fisheries currently include the large, large net steel net fisheries targeting chinook currently in the zone four or five area. Actually, Coho in zones one through three, as well as the plus area fisheries. And for quite some time, the fall season fisheries have been the largest in the Columbia River in terms of catch, but the fall stocks also contribute significantly to ocean harvest along the Pacific coast, thereby requiring staff involvement in various in the jurisdictional forums. Next slide. Uh, so fall is you know, probably our most complex season, partly due to the sheer number of different stocks that we need to account for, and also because of the various fishery subcomponents that I mentioned, mentioned both recreational and commercial. Uh, in terms of the stocks, for example, the fall snook run is comprised of seven, seven different stocks, of which three are ESA listed. And we also have ESA listed coho and steelhead and some uh, occurring at the same time. We need to manage for those also. And all of all of these, as well as several of the non-listed chinook components, have their own management objectives. So it's always a complex balancing act. Uh, since the weakest stock can limit harvest opportunities for the more abundant stock. And uh, we did include additional information on the various NIC stocks and their destinations within the basin and various management objectives 
questions? Hearing none, I think you're off the hook, John. Thank you very much. Okay. He's actually still on the hook, but in a different way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so moving on to white sturgeon, uh, you know, in addition to our salmon, various salmonid fisheries, we have white sturgeon management and fisheries occur throughout the year in the Columbia, uh, both above and below Bonneville Dam. Uh, the catch and release fisheries are year round, except for seasonal closures and spawning sanctuaries. Um, as far as retention seasons, the first of the year generally uh, they occur in zone six, which is that area between Bonneville and McNary dams uh, where the three reservoirs are located and those fisheries start each year around uh, on January 1 and they're managed to specific harvest guidelines. Uh, below Bonneville Dam, our recent retention fisheries have typically occurred in the late spring in the estuary, which uh, in this case we call the lower 40 miles of the river and then Again, we have uh, fall fisheries in the area above Wana Power Lines, which is at River Mile 40, upstream to Bonneville Dam. Uh, next slide. So in, in terms, um, let's see, did we advance one too many here? I think uh, I think we want the lower Columbia slide. I'm sorry. There we go. I was one ahead of you to start with, John. I apologize. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, that's my fault. Um, so in terms of management below Bonneville Dam, uh, the lower Columbia River and Oregon Coast Conservation Plan was adopted by the commission in 2011, and that provides policy guidance and long-term management goals for a healthy population. Uh, to monitor the white sturgeon population, we do conduct annual mark recapture assessments each year to develop our abundance estimates of sub-adult and adult uh, sturgeon. And this, this also provides growth and survival information. And each fall, we conduct surveys of the young of the year sturgeon, which were the babies that were spawned earlier that year, and that helps us evaluate annual spawning success and recruitment. And the White Sturgeon Conservation Plan identifies a maximum annual harvest rate uh, for white sturgeon of 16%. But since we reopened retention fisheries in 2017, 
after a three year hiatus, we, we've been managing closer to the more in the range of three to five percent as a uh, conservation measure to aid in rebuilding uh, that population. Uh, next, Chris. And so in the mid Columbia, specifically the zone six area, which includes uh, Bonneville, Sedals, and John Day Reservoirs, uh, we have uh, treaty commercial and treaty subsistence and recreational uh, white sturgeon retention fisheries uh, in that area. And, uh, these populations in each of the reservoirs are much smaller than the population below Bonneville Dam. And they're functionally isolated from each other, each other, so each pool is managed independently. The guidelines for management, surgeon management in this area are developed by the Surgeon Management Task Force. And that was established through the U.S. The Oregon process, and that includes staff and policy reps from Oregon, Washington, and the treaty tribes. And each year, they that task force evaluates the population status in the zone six pools and develops pool specific guide, harvest guidelines for both treaty and non-treaty fisheries. To help inform this process, we uh, conduct population abundance uh, well, mark recapture surveys are conducted each year. Uh, sorry. Uh, they're conducted on a three-year rotation, so one pool a year, and they're they're done by staff from Oregon, Washington, and the uh, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. And we also do Young of the Year index sampling in those pools to track on success. And uh, what we've seen is the the harvest guidelines over time tend to go cycle up and down with the trends in recruitment, which are generally better in high flow years and limited in the low flow years. So that concludes the white sturgeon section. Uh, if there are any questions, we'd be glad to take them. Commissioners? Um, I have one and it's, it, if, if we went back and looked at all of the uh, management plans for these different um, species in the Columbia. There are management objectives for the for each of the populations there, right? That's where to go look. I'm thinking about what you said, Tucker, about the broad sense recovery and where we're trying to get. But do we have management objectives in those for the wild stocks? Uh, Chair Wall, this is this is Chris. I, I think the 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 best approximation for that, or the best uh, number to supply for that, would probably be uh, what we'd call the recovery objectives um, within the individual recovery plans. Okay. Um, and those are the long term goals um, where we want those populations to end up, um, and and to to meet the viability definitions that would be a principal component, though not the only one, of them achieving a status where they could be delisted and be deemed recover recovered and healthy. And each of, do each of the plans also have broad sense numbers so that we could at least be looking at those? Uh, I, I, well, Tucker, I think they do. I mean, I, I think I'm, I think the number and the objective I'm referring to is, is actually is that uh, what, the way you referred to it, the broad sense goal. Yeah, broad sense goals are defined in, in a statute in Oregon. I, I just I did want to check real quick and and make sure that 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 question from Chair Wall was uh, sort of management plan general and not sturgeon specific. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Though, is the answer different? Well, it, well, the sturgeon aren't listed, and so there isn't a recovery plan that you would reference. We have um, the management objectives for that defined in, um, in uh, uh, for the lower Columbia, at least, in our conservation and re, uh, management yep. plan yep. that was referenced here. So not different, just a different place. Yeah. Right, and yep. so not recovery goals, but a lot of the same concepts in mind. 
Right. Very similar concepts. Uh, okay. that those concepts drive our our conservation and management plan form format in the state. Um, from the state perspective, uh, even for unlisted stocks, we tend to follow a similar format. Okay. Thank you. Great. And I'll just mention um, Tucker and John are and uh, are great resources on sturgeon questions. Um, kind of similar to John and Jeff having been past um, program managers of the select area project. Tucker and John and myself all spent significant portions of our career in the sturgeon world as well. So, okay, <laughs> that's a lot of bench strength. Uh, and then uh, back to Jeff here, real quickly for well, not real quickly, but um, to the next section, which is on fishery monitoring. Um, yeah, thanks. This is Jeff again. Uh, just two slides here, which probably don't do justice to our, our fishery monitoring and assessment programs, but uh, again, we're trying to keep this fairly high level. So uh, as we've discussed, uh, you know, we have the, the responsibility to intensively monitor all of the fisheries to assess not only overall harvest, but also impacts to, to any ESA listed stocks and, and also um, in relation to other management metrics such as allocation sharing and, and catch balancing and, and all of the other things we've been talking about here today. And I, I should just mention right off the top that all of the monitoring efforts here, uh, we coordinate very closely with WDFW. It's a jointly managed system. As far as non-treaty fisheries go, we partner, you know, with WDFW on, and, and work with them on a daily basis. When it comes to treaty fisheries, we, you know, we work hand in hand also with, with the treaty tribes and, and even provide some resources to, uh, uh, assist them with monitoring of their fisheries as well. Um, so essentially, we the the needs are to to estimate total total catch, kept catch, and uh, non retained catch as well. Because we're you know, the 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 management criteria is not just how many fish you killed and kept, it's how and kept killed and kept. Sorry, that's how many you killed. The fishery killed in total. So uh, any mortality associated uh, with with uh, non-retention, you know, active release uh, needs to be accounted for as well in all of these same bins uh, that that apply to the the retained catch, um, stock specific, species specific, um, all all of these uh, different metrics. And so uh, so to to do that, uh, we we cannot rely strictly on on catch record cards that are turned in by anglers, uh, as as many other fisheries do. Uh, those just do not provide the level of detail or or the timeliness of, of catch estimates that are needed to effectively manage fisheries in the main stem Columbia River. Um, and again, uh, anything any fisheries uh, on stocks that are that are covered in the management agreement um, are reviewed, coordinated, uh, uh, shared freely within uh, the USV Oregon Technical Advisory Committee and into the, the policy committee as well. And we'll move to the next slide then. Uh, for, for recreational fisheries, uh, there's two fundamental components to, to making these estimates, uh, catch rates and, and effort. And so we have a creel survey program in place that's been, um, well, let's see, I think it went, was first kind of developed uh, in the mid 60s uh, and then has expanded since then. We have a recent uh, creel survey program operating in the, in the area between Bonneville Dam and McNary Dam too. That's just come on online here in the last couple of years. Uh, but the the intent there is to to estimate uh, both effort and catch, and so the uh, in the lower river effort is estimated uh, from from effort flights. We we contract uh, with, with either private pilots or Oregon State Police to conduct uh, two effort flights weekly, one on a weekday and one on a weekend, and then we have on the ground um, personnel that that will uh, be conducting inter angler interviews at uh, at the the ramps or, or bank areas that they fish at to get uh, an estimate of, of catch rates. The the above Bonneville Creole program, 
does, does not have the flight uh, component to it, effort is directly estimated out of that Creole program there. Uh, for commercial fisheries, um, the required fish ticket data provides total landings in, in, the, in poundage by, by species typically. Um, sometimes finer scale, but uh, what, we, what we get uh, reported, and, and again, this is where Oregon and Washington have to coordinate closely because we have separate fish ticket uh, processes in each state, and, and those need to be combined to produce uh, uh, combined estimates for, for Oregon and Washington fishers. So if I didn't mention it earlier, any, any estimates that come out of our program are, are, are for both Oregon and Washington. So it's, it's the, the aggregate uh, catch estimates for, for both states. Uh, so so the, the fish tickets provide total poundage and then we have samplers in the field uh, collecting uh, biological attributes, including uh, uh, data to, to estimate the average weight and then we use those average weights applied to the total poundage landed to, to come up with uh, convert into fish numbers themselves. And for both recreational and commercial fisheries, uh, they're sampling for those biological attributes, uh, which would also include um, scale information to, to uh, develop an age composition, which comes into play uh, post-season when we're reconstructing runs and, and developing our forecasts for the upcoming season and also collection of coded wire tags uh, which informs estimates uh, of, of age composition uh, when combined with the, the scale age data and also uh, stock identification as well. This, this is how we uh, this is our, our base uh, data piece that we have to, to re rely on for assessing stock composition of, of catches. And then any, uh, any estimates of, of released fish um, um, are, are have a, a post-release mortality rate and that differs and varies uh, amongst gear species uh, and fisheries to, to estimate the number of released fish that would be expected to uh, to perish um, as a as a as a result of, of being handled and, and released, and then those those uh, have to be uh, binned out into the same uh, stock compositions and age compositions as the release catch to to come up with the, the holistic uh, reconstruction of, of harvest effects. Yeah, and those those release mortality rates for the most part um, um, have been discussed, reviewed, and uh, by the USV Oregon Technical Advisory Committee, uh, so all of the the USV Oregon parties are in agreement on on the rates to be to be used. That's it. That's a very high level uh, <laughs> look at, uh, at monitoring harvest. Uh, okay. Commissioners, questions. I have I have two, and I'm not sure who to, who is the right person, but I'll just ask them. The first one is that at, at several of our meetings, a concern has been raised about the night um, monitoring and on boat observations being reduced. Is that um, something that you're concerned about, or is it um, something that we we didn't feel like it was useful, so we it were okay if it's reduced or was it even reduced? Uh, Chair Wall, this is Chris. I'll take a crack at it and others can jump in. Uh, I would say to characterize it reduced is, is not accurate. Uh, I assume we are talking about the commercial fishery monitoring, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the fall um, main stem fishery. Um, that is one that we have done onboard observations periodically over the years, but not every year. Um, and so uh, it's an intensive and not cheap effort to do. And also the fact is that the several times we have done it, we tend to get fairly similar results as a re, uh, uh, in, the, in the observations and the data we get from them. So um, while I don't think it's our intent to never monitor it again or do onboard observations, uh, I think the return on investment and the actual data 
change that we get by conducting additional uh, or by trying to do it every year is um, not necessary. Um, when we have done the uh, main stem tangle net fishery in the spring or even the main stem large mesh fishery in the spring, which we haven't done for several years, those were observed uh, every time they occurred. Um, so a little different scenario, but that is also a marked selective fishery, which does have a, a significant real-time data need for, for supplying the released fish estimates. The fall fishery uh, observations, as I said, you know, we've done a pretty significant amount of work in combination with Washington on conducting those and using the data from those to inform our models and estimates for how we account for impacts on released fish, which, which for the fall is um, mostly a, an issue with uh, listed steelhead um, accounting. So I don't know if others want to add to that. Then let me ask the the other question, and then if somebody wants to add to yours, they can still do that too. Um, my question would be where are the biggest monitoring gaps? But from listening to you, it would seem that the Columbia is in relatively good shape with monitoring, with the obvious caveat that everybody would always want more. But there aren't, there don't seem to be huge gaps. And I'm wondering what the the Columbia situation is relative to the rest of the uh, chair chair wall, I think your audio dropped out. I think the question was how's the how's the rest of the state compared to the Columbia for monitoring of fisheries? Yeah, Chris, this is Kurt. It looks like she dropped. She must have her internet must have dropped. So uh. We'll we'll let uh, Vice Chair Woolley run the meeting unless she rejoins quickly. Okay, we are. Um, I'm not sure how much more we have for questions, but we are nearing the very end. We only have a couple slides to go, um, and so just uh, uh, Commissioner Woolley, just you know your your call on that. But um, I I can go ahead and try and address that question unless you want to skip it and maybe come back when uh, Chair Wall is able to join. Why don't you go ahead and address that? And, and okay. she, may, she may be able to hear you but not speak. And so for the benefit of everyone listening, why don't you go ahead and address that question? Okay. Um, so I, as I'm, a, the, the part of the question I heard was, um, you know, sort of we've outlined a fairly intensive uh, monitoring and I would add managing. Um, uh, so sort of the collection of the data and then the use of the data in the Columbia and how does that compare to other areas? Um, that's a pretty variable answer. There are, uh, Jeff mentioned catch record cards. There are plenty of, uh, and I'm just going to speak to salmon and steelhead fisheries for the moment. Um, there are plenty of salmon and steelhead fisheries where an annual monitoring via returns of catch record cards and the statistical expansion that goes with those is, is actually pretty, pretty good and sufficient for estimating uh, fishery related mortalities. These are generally places where we don't have uh, ESA listed fish or where we have really low impacts and not much uh, effect on them. So the monitoring can be a little less uh, intensive. Um, the ocean fishery uh, maintains a pretty, pretty um, a similarly robust, I would say probably not quite as robust as the Columbia, but pretty darn close uh, in terms of uh, particularly estimating uh, catch. Um, there's a really um, good program uh, for doing that in the ocean salmon fisheries that is actually very similar to the Columbia. A little different math in some places, but the same basic structure. Um, the Columbia is uh, a factor of sort of the monitoring needing to meet the need uh, to monitor for ESA species. So it is uh, uh, a, a, a child of that need, so to speak. It's the, the, the invention that, that came out of necessity uh, to get to that level of detail. And we have continually adapted to try and adjust to new things. Um, you know, the spring tangle net fishery and the advent of Mark selective commercial fishing required uh, development of onboard monitoring methods and, and statistical met metrics to deal with those uh, as just one example. Um, so it, it, it is probably 
uh, I would say it is one of the examples of the most intensive sorts of fishery monitoring we have in the state, if not the most intensive. The Willamette is uh, almost identical in, in terms of its structure for recreational creel survey. Um, but there are some that are close, and I would say the ocean salmon fishery is in there uh, where we have ESA listed species and have fisheries that are acting on um, a stock with a with an intermixed uh well, I'm thinking of Northeast Oregon, where we do have some uh, periodic harvest fisheries for hatchery salmon, but we also have ESA listed species present and and creel surveys can be employed there uh, for the same sorts of reasons we're talking about here. Idaho does some of the same things. Uh, I'm not super familiar with their sampling programs, but they have some of the same needs. Hey, uh, Chris, Chair, uh, I guess, Chair Parent Woolley. Um, yeah, vice, that would be Vice Chair Tucker. Vice Chair Willie, uh, I think, you know, monitoring is one component and it's definitely, you know, a very heavily monitored uh, suite of fisheries in the Columbia. I think one of the things that truly makes the Columbia unique it, is the ability to use that monitoring uh, based off of in-season updates to run sizes uh, and intensively manage those fisheries. So. Uh, where other fisheries are, uh, you know, adjusting seasons uh, based off of monitored catch, uh, they're usually not adjusting their abundances in season as well. And so that is like a really interesting, I think, an intensive interplay where uh, not just the number you're taking off the top, but the allowable number uh, is changing uh, sort of as you progress through these different seasons. And that's, uh, that's um, you know, one of the things I think is quite interesting and important to remember with the Columbia. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, correct me if my memory is wrong, but we have had to make some adjustments mid season uh, with some emergency rules based on uh, information that we've got during the season, right? Constantly, that that is the crux of what, what John and and Tucker and Jeff do is react to that on a day-to-day -day basis, yes. Yeah, yeah, we do have to turn on a dime at times. Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, this is a bit of a uh, qualitative statement, I guess, but, you know, when I talk to folks from uh, places like Alaska, and we often hear, you know, people talk about salmon management in Alaska, which of course is is also very intensive. But when I start talking about some of the details of how we operate on the Columbia, I get some pretty blank stares back um, sometimes. Um, and they've got fisheries that are comparable in certain places, but they also have some that are much, much less, uh, uh, I won't say intensive, but uh, the turnaround not being quite so fast. Uh, mm -hmm. So okay. it is relatively unique. Yeah. Yeah. As evidenced by your very thorough answer. So, so thank you for that. <laughs> Um, do, do you have additional slides or a wrap up? We want to be able to just get some general questions from from our commissioners, if, you know, as time allows. Or we have about 20 minutes left. I just have one more content slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's go. And this one was going to be me. Um, I was just going to kind of wrap up, and we've we've actually touched on several of these already, um, but it's just sort of a, a couple of take homes. And I wasn't sure really what to call this slide, so I, I ended up on commission authorities. But what are the, I'm really just trying to highlight some of the most common um, sort of pathways by which the commission and, and your decisions and, and input uh, are taken and moved to affecting the fisheries themselves. So this isn't an exhaustive list. It's not a list to try and define uh, those. It just sort of highlights some. Um, some of the regulations that we have relative to fisheries are statutory. An example of that would be the um, prohibition of retention of, of steelhead in non-treaty commercial fisheries. Um, but the majority of them really are under the authority of, of you, the commission, um, to establish. Um, relative to the Columbia fisheries, I think this has kind of become a little pretty clear probably, the delegation of authority to the director, which does also carry down to um, Director Melcher's delegation for the compact, um, is really critical uh, in terms of implementing the emergency rules because in order to meet both the conservation and the fishery objectives, um, we really do have to make, as, as we just said, you know, decisions on a dime that turn on a dime. 
Um, and that is a lot more rapid time scale than what really functions very well with the normal commission rulemaking process. Um, that said, there are plenty of rule and input uh, or guidance um, processes that fit just fine in those time frames. And so clear commission policy uh, rules and guidance is what we really rely on to implement the fisheries that are consistent with your objectives as a commission. Uh, and so that that is critical. Um, this is a little bit of a shift in topic, but a, a little reminder that when we talk about allocations in the Columbia and Jeff touched on this as well. We're usually talking about allocation of impacts as opposed to when you talk about allocation in a lot of other fishery contexts, you're talking about catch. Um, and so the allocation is relevant um, because those those policies the commission has right now on allocation uh, are speaking to allocation of ESA impacts in most cases. Uh, the exception really being Sturgeon and Summer Chinook that we talked about. And then I think also we've kind of covered this over here that the allocation of, uh, of those impacts is not generally not going to result in a, a similar percentage of catch. I mean, they'll go in the same direction, but there are a lot of other nuances that I think we've covered that can affect what those are. And that's another thing that sometimes surprises folks. Um, so those were really the highlights. Um, and just trying to wrap it up. Um, and believe it or not, we made it. Okay. I want to allow time. Thank, thank you so much. This has been super helpful. And I, I, as I've stated before, it's just so important that there's a, a foundation of knowledge moving forward because this is ongoing. Uh, this will keep coming up. Uh, we'll have to revisit the plan and update and get get updates from staff. And so everybody needs to, to have this background. So this is really helpful. I want to allow this time for commissioners to ask questions. And, and I had a a comment as well. And and so commissioners, do you have any remaining questions you'd like to ask? Uh, you know, the entire, just going back through your notes, uh, through the entire presentation. It's, it's, I, I just I just have a comment. Uh, I'm just wondering if for uh, all of our presenters, is this how you feel right now? For that picture? <laughs> uh, I won't speak for anybody else, but I think for, for John and Jeff in particular, you probably want to ask them about the end of September or mid-October when things are really uh, on the downside of the intensive fall fishery season. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyone well, else? This is Mark. I just have, I just have a comment, too. Th thank you. Um, you, you. I can tell you put a lot of work into this presentation, and it flowed very well. I still have a lot to learn. Um, probably as the others do too, but uh, every little bit helps. So thank you and the staff for, for a great presentation. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, and this is Becky, and I think I'll just weigh in really quickly also to, to thank you all for a, a really good um, afternoon of presentations. And um, uh, it, it, it's, I can't even imagine um, what your days are like um, for the staff that's involved in in managing this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really incredible to have that breadth of knowledge and understand how all these pieces fit together. So uh, I'm I'm fairly in awe. Okay. <laughs> Great. This is Mary. I'd like to add one thing to, and um, definitely ditto what you said, Commissioner Woolley, about. Um, this being very helpful to have. Um, and it was robust, it was useful, it's great to have the background, so thank you. I do have a question to you, Chris. Um, could you say just a little bit more on what you said about usually impact, the, or you we usually end up allocating the impacts versus the catch, except with sturgeon and, and one other species. Could you just say a little bit more about the why that's important? Oh, sure, uh, Chair Walt. Yeah, what I was trying to get at is is um, when most folks around the country talk about allocation in the fishery, they're they're talking about allocation of kept catch. Uh, so when we go to the Pacific Fishery Council uh, and talk about groundfish, 
um, and allocations between sectors. Those are usually in, in landed catch, although more recently they also include some bycatch mortality. But mm -hmm. um, what we're, and, and we do handle it that way in general for Summer Chinook, which as we mentioned is Upper Columbia Summer Chinook, which is based on the harvestable surplus. Um, we do include release mortalities in there, but but it is more of a landed catch and, and harvestable number, which maybe harvestable number should have been the, the phrase I used. And sturgeon is also based on a harvested number. The All the other fisheries that we're talking about, if I use spring Chinook, we are trying to turn a 2% or less or whatever whatever the annual limit is, limitation on wild fish mortalities into some amount of landed catch. Mm -hmm. And the conversion of how much landed catch comes out of that is totally dependent on what the mix of allocations and gears and everything else looks like because that that sort of drives the mortality that's associated with each landed fish. Um, and so the real take home is just, uh, if you have an 80-20 allocation of impacts, it doesn't mean you're gonna have an 80-20 allocation of the kept catch or the harvest. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it that, might. that's important. It might, it might work out that way, but I would normally not. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we go, I just wanted to say, um, again, this has been a, a wonderful sort of grounding for everybody. And it, it mainly talks about what the staff does. And what we addressed as commissioners is a little different. We take in all of this, this background information for our knowledge. But the things that we've been dealing with over the years have been some of the things that have been mentioned that ideally we, we shouldn't have to focus on. Um, Kurt mentioned that conservation is the, is the overall goal that we strive for. Uh, Commissioner Labhart said, you know, we shouldn't have to be focusing so much on size of mesh sizes and, and allocations. However, that has not been the case and that will not not be the case <laughs> moving forward. Uh, the kinds of decisions that we've had to make as a commissioner have come down to what stocks will be fished in what seasons, what gear types will be used, and in allocations. That has taken up the bulk of our time. And this is what you all will be hearing about from our user groups uh, very intensely. And so I don't want folks to be caught flat-footed. I mean, all, all of the data uh, that's been presented today is really important. Uh, and when the rubber meets the road, those are the things that are gonna be taking up our time. Um, you know, we even had one of our field trips, we, we looked at net nets, you know, and we, we looked at harvest techniques and, and mesh sizes. You know, it's still not settled, uh, you know, whether or not commercial fisheries are, are um, selective or not, you know, that, that, that continues on. So uh, we've got to sort some of those things out, uh, continue to do that as we go along. Uh, so just kind of a heads up of what's to come and uh, I'll be with you on it for a while and then for a while not so much. So, so good luck with that. Good summary. Greg, and great point. Um, and we've been hoping that we would be able to shift the conversation some and fully recognizing that this is the conversation that we typically end up with, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so so just a heads up, and I think the commissioners are generally aware if they've been keeping track of this prior to, to getting onto the commission. Uh, this is what our user groups, these are things that they care about the most and they're the things that they'll continue to put before us. And the concurrency with Washington is not necessarily easy. I think as Tucker alluded to, uh, or Chris, um, it, it takes some work to get there. And um, we, we have to go through that process again. Uh, Chair Wall, if I, or, or Vice Chair Woolley, if I could just, uh, this Chris real quick. Yep, go ahead. I just, I really appreciate the opportunity and and, uh, and the rest of the staff do too, um, to actually take some time to walk through these things um, because you do, you do get um, significant 
bits and pieces, but you do get hit with bits and pieces um, uh, periodically, as well as relatively large scale, robust issues that um, uh, Vice Chair Woolley just mentioned. Um, so it, it was really, I think, helpful for us also to be able to kind of sit down and walk through some of these details um, with you today. So I appreciate that. Great. Well, thank you. And maybe we'll have another one at some point. Um, but this has been remarkably helpful. So enjoy the rest of your day. The last two minutes that you have. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you for staying with it for all of this time. Um, and commissioners, we'll see you at eight o'clock tomorrow. All right. Look forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.